Hello, I'm Beth Schlachter, Executive Director of FP2020. Welcome to Celebrating Progress, Transforming for the Future. FP2020 was launched with a simple premise that every woman and girl, no matter where she lives, should have the opportunity to use life-saving, life-changing modern contraception. The leaders who gathered at the London Summit in 2012 agreed on an ambitious goal and a tight time frame for achieving it, to reach 120 million additional users of modern contraception in the world's lowest income countries by 2020. That initial eight year period has now drawn to a close. We didn't reach 120 million, but we did bend the curve of progress upward. The FP2020 initiative has become a movement with more than 130 governments, foundations, multilateral, civil society, and youth-led organizations, and private sector partners all collaborating to advance rights-based family planning. Dozens of countries have strengthened and expanded their family planning programs over the past eight years, providing millions of women and girls with access to the life-saving modern contraception they want and need. Together, we've cultivated a global community of practice that is grounded in data and evidence and guided by the principles of human rights. That's the story we're going to discuss today as we celebrate the FP2020 partnership and launch our final progress report, FP2020, The Arc of Progress. We'll also tell the story of how in the past year, family planning programs faced their greatest threat yet, the COVID-19 pandemic and how partners all over the world continue to work heroically to maintain health services. And finally, we'll look ahead to what comes after FP2020, a new partnership that is smarter, stronger, more inclusive, and built to take us to 2030. Over the next three hours, we'll be hearing from speakers in 20 countries spread over five continents who have been a part of this unique partnership. Today also marks the first step on a new journey in a little over an hour, we'll launch our transformation to the new partnership for the coming decade, a partnership that you helped to shape and sharing how you, your organization, your country can continue to be a part of it. Shortly coming up, we'll hear from Melinda Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Dr. Natalia Kanan, executive director of the UN Population Fund, Wendy Morton, Minister for European Neighborhood and the Americas at the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, and Chris Milligan, Counselor at the US Agency for International Development. The FP2020 partnership would not exist if it were not for the collaboration of the Gates Foundation, UNFPA, and the governments of the United Kingdom and the United States. But first, I want to take the opportunity to thank all of you watching for your partnership and your commitment to women and girls. We're glad to have this opportunity to celebrate the progress we've made together, even if we must do so virtually. Because of our collaboration and your innovation, dedication, and partnership over the last eight years, we have ensured that 60 million additional women and girls have been able to use modern contraception, taking control of their reproductive choices and their futures. We'd like you to participate in today's event as well, and we wanna hear your views and your questions. Please put them in the chat or on YouTube or Facebook and we'll respond through social media. We also invite you to share the event on your social media and we'd really appreciate your help to spread the word using the hashtag MyFPStory. But first, let's get started by taking a look at what brought us here together today.
So the stage is set for a lively and informative celebration of our past and an optimistic glance into our future. Shortly, we'll delve into the impact of the FP2020 partnership. We'll be hearing from a great panel on how the partnership has developed since the 2012 London Summit. And we'll hear from partners about how family planning links to and advances their work on reproductive health, environmental conservation, emergency preparedness and humanitarian response, and HIV prevention and care. We'll demonstrate the impact our collective efforts have had and how we measure that impact. And we'll hear from partners around the world doing some inspiring work to improve and advance access to contraception and sexual and reproductive health and rights. And then it's time to look ahead to the next decade to our renewed partnership, FP2030. Building on the momentum from eight years of FP2020 and strengthened by the difficult trials of this past year, the global family planning community is ready to embark on a new decade of partnership. FP2030 will preserve and expand on the best of FP2020, but shift the balance of power so that countries are in the lead, decision-making is localized, civil society is a full partner in accountability, and commitments are centered on the lived experiences of women and girls in all their complexity and diversity. The mandate for our next phase has never been clearer. Together, we will build on the progress we've made, recover from the impact of COVID-19, and advance toward the, 2030 vision, the FP2030 vision of working together for a future where women and girls everywhere have the freedom and ability to lead healthy lives, make their own informed decisions about using contraception and having children, and participate as equals in society and its development. To achieve this, we'll look at how we intend to center data, rights, and accountability in the new partnership, addressing issues such as gender and racial equality and inclusion. We'll hear from ministers and ministries of health and from adv advocacy partners around the world. Finally, we'll kick off this year, 2021, as a year of FP2030 commitment making with current and new partners. And don't forget, we want you to get involved today as well. Join the conversation on the platform you're watching now or on social media using the hashtag MyFPStory. And now I'm delighted that we're sharing our or starting our celebration with a message from Melinda Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Hi, I'm Melinda Gates, and this is a message to everyone who has worked to expand access to contraceptives over the last decade. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I remember nine years ago at the London Family Planning Summit, I was nervous. I hadn't given many speeches about the subject before, but I knew that I was going to be talking about literally an issue of life or death. And I remember there was an article published in The Lancet around the time. It concluded that access to contraceptives could cut the number of mothers and children who died in childbirth by a third. I also knew that when women can choose when to have children and how many, it unlocks a cycle of prosperity. More women thrive and that cycle benefits everyone. More girls stay in school, women are freer to work outside the home, and more children survive childhood. It's been almost a decade since the London Summit and when we started the Family Planning 2020 Partnership. And now that cycle I just spoke about is happening in so many places for millions more women. 60 million more women and girls in the world's low-income countries gained access to family planning in the last decade. That's because of you, and it's cause for celebration. But we also have to acknowledge the reality. We have more work to do. For me, one of the toughest parts of 2020 was tracking how the effects of COVID-19 rippled out, threatening the progress we've made. Travel restrictions, contraceptive shortages, and clinic closures put life-saving family planning services out of reach for millions of women and girls, and it set back our hard-won progress. Early estimates suggest 49 million additional women will go without contraceptives because of the pandemic. That would lead to 15 million additional unplanned pregnancies. As things stand today, 
200 million women of reproductive age, more than the entire population of Brazil, have an unmet need for modern contraceptives. As we rebuild from this crisis, the world needs to put women's reproductive health at the center of its efforts. A renewed partnership is critical for that, an ambitious partnership that puts family planning front and center in health, development, and the global recovery. My mother had a saying, it was part of what led me to speak up back in 2012 in London, and it is motivating me again now. She would say to me as a young girl, if you don't set your own agenda, someone else will set it for you. One thing we know about the giant global crisis like this pandemic is that in the immediate aftermath, the world changes in big and permanent ways. There is a window for action, and that window is opening now. Together, governments, communities, donors, the private sector, civil society, we can set the agenda. Thank you so much for all you do. Thank you, Melinda. The leadership of the Gates Foundation, the UK government, USAID, and UNFPA launched the FP2020 partnership at the 2012 London Summit, and we're deeply grateful for the support of the Gates Foundation and for your personal dedication to gender equality and championship of women and girls. I'm now pleased to introduce FP2020 Reference Group Co-Chair and UNFPA Executive Director, Dr. Natalia Canem, for your keynote address. Excellencies, distinguished participants, partners, and friends. As co-chair of the FP2020 Reference Group, I'm so pleased to join this important event. We come together to applaud progress achieved by the partnership and to celebrate the transition of our community's efforts towards 2030 and beyond. All of us should be proud of our collective accomplishments. Over the past eight years, we have made investments in family planning that have indeed transformed communities right around the world. We have developed innovations in data, in data systems, in supply chains, and in contraceptive technologies. We've in implemented new service delivery strategies, and we have elevated human rights and the quality of care. And most importantly, we have built an unparalleled global network that spans institutions and bridges geographies and sectors. We could not have gotten here without the incredible efforts of the FP2020 Secretariat. My deep gratitude to FP2020's Executive Director Beth Schlachter for her leadership and her vision. And at this pivotal moment, I'm also thinking about Valerie de Filippo and Babatunde Oshotimeyan, who are no longer with us. Both were staunch proponents of the FP2020 movement since its inception, and both knew that strong investments in family planning were the key to building the future we want. At the Family Planning Summit in 2012, Professor Oshotimeyan committed to increasing the allocation of UNFPA's resources for family planning from 25% to 40%. And I am pleased to say that we have met and even surpassed this ambitious commitment. As part of the FP2020 coalition, UNFPA has benefited greatly from the data and advocacy brought to the table by others. Global commitments have also brought us modern contraceptive methods at lower prices allowed us to expand contraceptive choice for women and girls. A major vehicle for our efforts to expand choice and to end the unmet need for family planning is the UNFPA Supplies Partnership, which recently entered a new phase. As the UNFPA Supplies Partnership transitions to its next iteration, we look forward to strengthening our work with FP2020's new regional hub model, which will allow us to facilitate South-South learning and advocate for increased family planning investments. Dear friends, how we invest in and support women and girls today will determine 
what the world looks like in 2030. And with less than a decade to go, the Global Family Planning Partnership remains a crucial platform for the full achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. And yet we know that the COVID pandemic is making the road to 2030 steeper. It's exacerbating inequalities. COVID has limited bodily autonomy. Adolescent girls have suffered disproportionately, and we see that teen pregnancy is on the rise. At the beginning of this crisis, UNFPA estimated that over 12 months, 50 million women in 114 countries would lose access to family planning. And this will lead to 15 million unintended pregnancies. So now more than ever, we need to work together to ensure that the impact of a pandemic that has dominated the past year will not erase all of the gains that we have made. We must adapt, we must, we must build back better, and we've got to keep our sights set firmly on a future where every woman and girl, no matter where she lives, has the ability to make her own informed decision about using contraception and having children, and so that she can participate fully in society. We know where we're going, and we certainly know how far we have come. So let us move forward with renewed energy and rise, rise to the challenges in front of us. It was Tony Cade Bambara who once said, the dream is real. The failure to realize it is the only unreality. So let's take collective action to end the unmet need for family planning by 2030. And let us make that dream a reality for all. The march forward continues. Adelante. Thank you, Natalia. We're grateful for your leadership of the FP2020 Reference Group and your commitment to ending unmet need continues to inspire and motivate us all. We also appreciate you laying out so clearly the work we have ahead of us and the moment that we're in. Since 2012, the FP2020 Partnership has brought together stakeholders from UN partners to youth leaders, from governments to implementers, from advocates to the private and corporate sectors, I'm pleased to now welcome our first panel to discuss the evolution and impact of the partnership over time, where we will hear from organizations and individuals who have been instrumental in building this partnership and the family planning movement, including in the years and decades predating FP 2020. We'll hear their perspectives on the successes of the partnership and how we take forward the lessons learned and mo maintain momentum toward 2030. While we're chatting, I hope you will join the conversation on social media. Use the hashtag MyFPStory, shown here on your screen, to tell us how the, FP2020, how the FP2020 partnership has advanced your own work and what lessons you'd like us to take forward. I'm now pleased to introduce our first panel. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Janice Melgar, Executive Director of Lecon Center for Women's Health in the Philippines and FP2020 Civil Society Focal Point. Alvaro Bermeo, Director General of the International Planned Parenthood uh, Federation and FP2020 Reference Group member. And Comfort Chinzinga, Key Populations Program Coordinator for, Mal for the Malawi Youth Net and an FP2020 Youth Focal Point. I'd like to start our discussion today with you, Janice, but in welcoming everybody, we really, we put this panel together with the idea that this would be both our moment of recognizing impact for Family Planning 2020, but also hearing again, your particular perspectives. You've all been important partners to all of us. And so by starting out with Janice, we wanted to start out with some of the cultural, social, and uh, legal norms that can sometimes be an impediment to progress in countries. Um, the Philippines fought for decades to ensure the right to family planning. And Junice, you and many others advocated for the reproductive health laws and policies to meet the needs of women and girls in the face of fierce cultural and social resistance, including from the Catholic Church. How has involvement in the FP2020 partnership supported LICAN, other advocates, and the government to achieve the progress that you've achieved um, in the last years, in recent years? I think uh, the values of, uh, of uh, FP2020 jives with the values of uh, advocates for reproductive health. 
that have been uh, fighting for the reproductive health law for 12 years. And it was very important, very important in your contribution was your emboldening the, the national government to actually invest publicly, explicitly for family planning because they have they were latecomers in the game. They came, and I think you can understand the vacillation because of the strong influence by the Catholic Church, but their commitment to you in 2012 signaled a uh, changing of the norms. I think uh, whatever happened, maybe because of the, the, the global movement behind FP2012, our leaders actually who are not used to pledging uh, publicly commitments. In fact, they tend to camouflage that because of the backlash. That was uh, that was a breath of fresh air when they came out. And I think that signaled to everyone that like the spell, the Catholic spell on uh, policymakers had been broken. And it was the start of uh, government and uh, civil society organizations, private organizations, development partners coming together actually to implement what was the the, the explicit, no, the very explicit, very public declaration of government. So, so that was a big step forward in 2012 when we were not sure, actually. It was a bold declaration. We weren't sure when the Secretary of Health pledged that they would pass the RH bill, that it indeed would pass in, 20, in, in December of that year. So it was a very precarious statement, but we were very happy with it. And I think it started this cooperation, this trusting between uh, non-government people and the government. Thank you, Janice. I think you beautifully articulated one of the strengths of this partnership, which has been around creating norms, creating really a community of practice that supports women's rights. And that context is different everywhere. The challenges are different everywhere. But at their core, they stem from this same resistance around empowering women and this change of practice about um, just a real autonomy and that women should have agency. And we feel that differently around the world. Alvaro, um, working with the Planned Parenthood Federation, you surely see that in many different contexts. I'm wondering if you can share from IPPF's perspective what the value of this partnership has been and how these issues are playing out for IPPF member associates or affiliates. With, with pleasure, Beth. Thank you. Um, yes, of course, IPPF being present in over 150 countries, we can see this all over. I'd like to start saying like, many others, we joined this partnership at the beginning because we felt there was real value and we could achieve more if we worked in a more joined up work, in a jo more joined up way. And we joined the partnership through the reference group, but also through participating in the performance monitoring and evidence working group, and also working closely with the secretariat on how to do more and how to do better in humanitarian crisis. From the work of the performance and monitoring and evaluation working group, I'd say that we benefited in many ways, but particularly from it becoming a forum, or maybe the forum, for establishing common family planning indicators, bringing donors together uh, to agree on measurements and establishing and galvanizing support for global common FP indicators. So that I would say was a big success. But the key question for us was, would this really translate at country level? And how could we help make uh, this work at country level, bringing together civil society into this partnership that was across sectors? If you give me two minutes, I, I just mention as an illustration the work in West Africa, which is in my from my point of view, one of the regions where FP2020 really helped change country level dynamics. We have nine member associations there, so we can see it quite 
broadly, and they played a key role both in the Ouagadougou partnership, but also in FP 2020 um, as focal points. And if I think of, for example, um, Cote d'Ivoire, um, where we co-led the setting up of a coalition of sexual and reproductive health civil society organizations to enable joint efforts in line with the FP 2020 agenda. That coalition is now in its fifth year and has around 20 members, has developed advocacy actions to enable a favorable social legal environment for family planning and SRH more broadly in Cote d'Ivoire. And it has also served as a way of holding the government to account, monitoring the implementation through something we call the motion tracker that was first validated in 2019. And that's just one example. I mentioned Cote d'Ivoire not because it's extraordinary. I could have told similar stories from Burkina, from Nigeria, from many others. So not because it's extraordinary, but because I think it's a good illustration of how the partnership has really made SRHR advocacy issues more effective and has been able, as Eunice was saying, to capitalize contributions from CSOs alongside the government. Thank you, Alvaro. I'm glad that you did share that story because you know, we have many partners who for a long time have been working on the supply side for family planning, including important partners like RHSC, and, and that work remains critical. But we all know that expansion for family planning programs and for SRHR more broadly really rests on the ability of advocates to change some of these social norms, again, around autonomy and to make sure that women have the commodities then that they need to find something that works well for them and that's right for them. And the more then the women are accepting, the better able we are to change the programs and strengthen them and improve quality over time. Uh, Comfort, I'd love to hear from you now from your perspective as a young woman and as a youth advocate about how working with youth advocates has uh, improved over time and what we've learned together about what meaningful youth engagement actually is. We all talk about it, but are we doing it well? Are we really opening up the seats of power and inviting young people to lead and to be a part of those discussions in a way that's transformative? I'd love to hear your perspectives on that. Oh, thank you so much, Beth. Um, are, are we doing good in terms of uh, involving young people in different platforms? Uh, I think we're not yet there, but uh, so far so good. I'll give a classic example of the uh, FP 2020. Initially, we never had a youth focal person um, uh, on that platform, but uh, we've seen it uh, grow to the point that uh, we're able to identify or rather create space for youth youth to be to be able to sit at the table uh, uh, with the introduction of the youth focal person, uh, which was recently introduced. I think the problem that uh, most of these uh, platforms organizations have is the fact that we usually put a, a young person uh, just for sure. Um, uh, as a form of tokenism, we just put them for people to recognize that we have a young person uh, in, in different platforms. But um, I think moving forward, it's good that young people should be fully engaged from the onset up until the end of uh, these engagements. And as I was giving an example that, yes, I think we are sort of improving from my point of view. Uh, because we're able to have a youth focal person and uh, we're able to furnish them with the necessary uh, equipment for them to be able to uh, participate in different activities as well as in different platforms. Uh, recently, I think through the FP 2020, young, young people, young focal people were able to be given a small grant for them to be able to carry out different activities. Um, so I think that that's, in a way, that's empowering a young person to be able to uh, contribute and and partake because at the end of the day, if you just put the young person there without furnishing them with the right equipment for them to be able to contribute, that's basically just a waste of time. But uh, I we're not yet there, but I think we're getting there uh, slowly. I think we'll be able to get there and fully engage young people in different platforms. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Comfort, and I couldn't agree more. This. Partnership has been a learning process for us throughout its evolution. And one of the things that we have seen is that we need to make this shift of 
thinking that we're providing a gift to young people by inviting them in instead of treating them like the professionals that they are and providing the kind of support that allows the networking and the engagement that you're describing. And I hope that we'll be able to lean into that more in the next iteration of the partnership, specifically because we know we have to work much more on this normative side of the partnership, but also because funding is ever tighter for advocacy. And yet this is the moment when we need to really lean into it. So Janice, I'd like to come back to you, if I may, and get your perspectives as a, as a service provider, but also as a lifelong advocate for these services, to hear how that's working for you in the Philippines and how that works for your partnership with the government in terms of making progress on the Philippines commitment. I can't hear Judice, so I'm wondering if her sound hasn't been turned on. Unmute yourself, Janice. Yeah, I'm so there sorry. I unmuted myself. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, I think my man, I was saying that we are in a very unusual place because we do run clinics in very poor communities. So we are in touch actually with what common women, actually poor women, uh, have uh, lots of discomfort with their providers, uh, right, lots of rights-based uh, complaints. No, But we are able to raise that at the policy level. So this is important, I think, for, for many women's groups that are working on the ground, working in the community, actually knowing exactly what's happening and how, uh, how acceptable uh, the access of services have, has been to them. But raising that, uh, we, we have been able to do that. And I think your uh, FP, F, FP 2020's focal points on CSO actually um, legitimized the important role of uh, civil society organizations, especially women's and young people's organizations, to bridge that yawning gap between uh, the communities with their own, with their own probably misgiving some, but uh, a lot of uh, long time neglect, the feeling of neglect and letting them seize on the opportunity actually to, to access services, but also to make decisions for themselves. So I, actually that is the important role of women's and young people's organizations. And we are trying to do that in our country so we have this vast reproductive health advocacy network that is made of different sectors, but especially those who really have difficulty in accessing and who have been neglected in policy. And we bring them together at the national implementation team for the reproductive health law, which was part of the law. So this law, and I think the focus of FP 2020 on participation, on hearing the voices, because eventually it will be uh, the community's acceptance of uh, family planning that will make a difference in our progress. So I think that this is all very good, and I hope that that commitment to community participation and the interface, the, the many interfaces between provider and women and young people and policy making, I, I hope that continues. Thank you very much. I hope it will as well. I, I That's our intent. You know, we had a focal point workshop in the Philippines that we co-hosted with Junice and many others um, in 2016. And for those who are unfamiliar with focal point workshops, they bring together the country teams, the government donors, usually USAID and UNFPA, and then a civil society representative like Junice and now a youth representative like Comfort. And they work together over the course of a number of days through a range of issues with technical experts. And it gives everybody a chance to look at their plans together, to learn from each other, to learn from other countries, and to have common cause um, for family planning programs. Um, but when we were in the Philippines, we were really moved by the incredible energy of civil society. I had so many other partners from the 16 other countries in the region come forward and say that that vibrancy was really inspiring to them them as well, and they felt a connection together. And so I 
to me, that's one of the great values that FB 2020 has brought forward is creating these regional con communities of practice that then you know, filter up to that sort of global movement as well. Um, I'd like to shift from focal points and thinking about focal point movements, Alvaro, to talking to you about the engagement of IPPF overall um, in this movement. I remember when the global gag rule was reinstituted, having conversations with IPPF and MSI and others about what had happened previously. That because of this sort of a fracture in the community and the need to find funding elsewhere, that the relationships had sort of floated away over time as well. And so we made a, dis a, a specific decision to ensure that MSI and IPPF remained on the reference group to demonstrate that people could have different opinions, they could make their own funny decisions based on their own frameworks, but that we as a community were going to try to find a way to work together. And that held throughout FP 2020, and in large part, that was through your engagement. So I'd love to hear your perspective on the reference group and its impact and how you feel IPPF and your personal engagement there um, made a difference. Thanks, Beth. And and it's, it's not always easy to separate the reference group from the work that you and the wonderful team at the Secretariat did to sort of make it possible. So let me start by just thanking you all for the support you provided to make the reference group successful. I think, as, as, as you say, you know, for the last four years, for what I would say has been a challenging four years with disastrous policy coming from the Trump administration, the FP 2020 managed to remain as the one convener where the US government and staff and, and technical people and implementers like ourselves and other donors came around the table to be able to plan together, to strategize together and to commit um, to a way forward. I think Maintaining that dialogue, keeping the channels open is a fantastic achievement. Without it, the disaster would have been much greater. We would have been able to achieve much less. So I'd also want to thank um, the staff at USAID, at CDC, and in other places that remained engaged through these difficult circumstances and coordinating with us. So. I think we need to protect that convener capacity that FP 2020 has had in the reference group and not just bringing donors and governments together, but bringing them together with civil society and bringing in also humanitarian players. And I would say since 2017, that has been another feature of FP 2020 and the work of the reference group that spotlight on humanitarian settings. And that's a good example of where it's difficult to differentiate the work of the reference group and the secretariat, because that was partly made possible because of the partnerships you created, including with us to sort of move that humanitarian agenda forward, but also because of some of your staff. And I'd like to remember Jen Schleck, who was a formidable force in this respect and helped us move forward. So I think the, 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 the reference group in that sense, and probably that has been its greatest strength, has been the, the convener where we were able to discuss from different points of view, from different perspectives, but with a common view and um, a desire to join up um, our action and our work to have greater impact. Thank you. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I think that's really part of the beauty of this partnership is many people saw an opportunity in it to advance their work and their perspectives. Jen came to our team because CARE approached us at the 2017 summit when we first talked about humanitarian work and the need to link up, especially with regard to the MISP, and offered a fellowship. And so we were able to welcome Jen onto the team and to take that work forward. And it really opened a door to a new kind of conversation that hadn't existed for family planning before around preparedness. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but I, I agree that there's a space there for new ways of working 
working new ways of thinking together and, and leading to greater creativity. So we just have a few minutes less, so um, time passes so quickly with these. Comfort, I want to turn to you and, and maybe give you the last word, um, because I know that um, you and many partners working in Malawi have had a major victory in avoiding cuts to the family planning commodity budget for 20. Um, 2020 and 2021, despite COVID, and actually increased funds from 176 million kwacha to 200 million kwacha. Can you talk about how this change is benefiting young people? Um, for, for starters, I'd like to explain that uh, one of the major causes of an unmet need for a young person is the frequent stock out of commodities in the in the facilities and the clinics and everything else. So the fact that the government was able to allow the increase in budget from 176 to 200 million, as you earlier mentioned, uh, this will uh, this will really help because uh, it means that there will be more commodities uh, which will be used, uh, especially when we are conducting outreach, because. Um, at the end of the day, you should imagine a young person who has traveled a long distance to try and access um, family planning, later on to realize that after getting there, there are no, um, there are no commodities. So uh, it's, it's, really, it's really devastating and it becomes really challenging for young people to continuously try and access a service they can't uh, really find. So the fact that the government was able to raise the budget, it means that there will be a range of commodities, meaning that if as a young person I didn't find what I was looking for, I'll be able to choose another one. But besides that, it also means that uh, they'll be able to have an increased number of outreach, whereby these services will be carried over to to the typical um, hard to reach areas, which which is really a good thing. So um, I would also like to commend the partnership for helping out in consultation and everything else to try and make sure that uh, the budget was actually increased from uh, 176 million to 200, which is a really good thing as I earlier mentioned. Thank you, Beth. Thank you so much, Comfort. We actually have a few more minutes left. Um, doing these live uh, events is a little tricky with regard to tech, so I'm glad that I was told we have a few minutes more. Um, gives me a chance to ask you another question, Janice, um, because one of the features of FP2020 is that we were funded um, pretty early on through Bloomberg Foundation and then the Gates Foundation and DFID and a few others to have a rapid response mechanism that we were able to use for small investments, not meant for long-term programs, but really when there was an opportunity to make a significant change that we could infuse quickly um, some funding to take something forward. So could you share uh, your involvement and the success of a rapid response mechanism investment? Yes, your, the rapid response mechanism actually helped tide over like a crisis situation in the Philippines when there was first, uh, first one was actually helping us do a research to overturn uh, a temporary restraining order by it was used actually to overcome a temporary restraining order by the supreme court on contraceptives approved by the fda so this again was a move by the anti reproductive health movement and they succeeded actually in staying uh, the commodities for two years before uh, the fda was able to justify that none of those 48 products held were abortive fashion. And our research, actually, in, in their decision to approve all 48, they cited uh, two studies that we included, actually, in that research that was funded by RRM. The other is actually in anticipation, again, of uh, opposition to a comprehensive sexuality education. We actually... Uh, we're able to gather stakeholders from different areas, not just young people, but also parents, community leaders, uh, health providers, actually to make a stake for, for CSE because that was questioned in the Supreme Court. So there is actually a pending um, decision by the Supreme Court said that it was premature to rule on the unconstitutionality of CSE until the DepEd rolls out its curriculum. The DepEd is about to roll that out. So I am hoping that the phalanx of, of advocates that we help to, to beef up, actually, the defense at the local and the national level through the RRM would be able to help us defend 
And I think even to popularize uh, CSE to communities and at the national level. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Beth. It does seem fundamental that young people, all people, should have access to comprehensive sexuality education, to understand their biology, to understand sexuality, and to be able to live their lives informed um, so that they can live safely and freely. Um, so now I really will turn to you, Comfort, for the last word. Um, and I think this is a great segue because I'd love to hear how Malawi is focused on reaching stigmatized populations, including young people, LGBTQI people, and sex workers. Do you feel the movement has made progress in this area, and how can we achieve more in the coming decade? Um, again, I'll still say we have a very long way to go. Uh, however, I would like to commend the government of Malawi for um, highlighting, uh, of course, not broadly, but a little bit tackling the issue of key population. So basically, they were able to recognize uh, the presence and also able to highlight um, their rights in our national um, youth-friendly health services uh, strategy, where they are able to indicate uh, how we can be able to reach to key population members, and uh, specifically the female sex workers, as well as the LGBTIQ uh, and everything else. So uh, through the strategy, which is the 2015 and 2020 strategy, they were able to highlight how um, female sex workers can be reached out, whether it's through the outreach and uh, the drop-in centers uh, with uh, different uh, sexual reproductive health services. So uh, I think that's that's quite a good thing because it shows that the government was able to recognize uh, that uh, we have key population amongst us. And uh, it's good that uh, sexual reproductive health services should reach out to um, all population, uh, leave no one behind, as we usually say, because the moment you leave key population uh, behind, it means we're leaving a, a huge, huge population behind, which in a way can come back and uh, affect our overall uh, goal and objectives. Yes. Thank you, Comfort. I'm very glad to end this discussion on that note, because just as the complexity of the partnership has evolved over time, it does so in realization that there isn't just one woman, one girl, one person who needs contraception. We're all complex beings. We live in complex societies, and the partnership and our response needs to be able to adapt and respond to those realities. And by creating a space where everybody can come together to share their perspectives, to work together to overcome barriers, I think that becomes our greatest strength. FB 2020 is not a funding mechanism, but we're a partnership of many people with many different authorities and abilities to function in our own communities, both locally and globally. And I believe that's the strength of the FB 2020 partnership that we'll be taking forward into 2030. So I want to thank all three of you. It's been such a pleasure to work with you and to get to know you as people. It's really been an honor. Thank you for being with us today and sharing your perspectives on FB 2020. I also want to continue to invite our audience to weigh in as well and share your perspectives. So for all of you watching at home, please share with us what you think about this conversation using the hashtag MyFPStory. And now I'm pleased to invite Wendy Morton, Minister for a European Neighborhood and Americas at the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office to provide remarks. The UK is a staunch champion of family planning and sexual reproductive health and rights. And you've been a core funder of FP2020 and a host of the 2012 and 2017 London summits. So I wanna thank you for your partnership and over to you, Minister Morton. Thank you, Beth. And I am so pleased to join you all today. This is such an exciting moment for family planning and the rights and freedoms of women and girls. But it's also a celebration of the wonderful global partnership that we've all built to support them. And listening to the conversation so far, I'm struck by the remarkable road we have traveled since 2012. We have a lot to make us humble and a lot to make us proud. In particular, I would like to pay tribute to the governments that have made commitments to FP 2020 and took huge strides to deliver those commitments, even in the toughest of years. Country leadership is at the heart of everything the partnership has achieved and will continue to achieve. The UK is a long-standing champion of comprehensive sexual and reproductive health and rights. We're we were delighted 
to host the planning, Family Planning Summits in 2012 and 2017, back in the days when we could welcome so many of you to London in person, of course. But we were very glad to help galvanise that, that action so that all women can realise their rights, their freedoms and their potential. And today we continue in an unwavering voice to defend and advocate for these commitments on the world stage. With aid investments in WISH, UNFPA supplies and the Global Financing Facility, we have been the second largest donor country to family planning in the world and the largest donor to UNFPA. Between 2019 and 2020 alone, UK aid helped over 25 million women and girls use modern methods of contraception. None of this fantastic work would be possible without countless leaders, activists, organisations and partners. Partners who share this commitment to increase the voluntary uptake of family planning. Partners, many of whom I am delighted to see here today. Strong partnerships need strong, great leadership. The UK has supported the FP2020 Secretariat since the beginning, as it has gone from strength to strength. Beth, your passion, your dedication and expertise have delivered so many of the partnership's recent successes. And I want to thank you for your outstanding leadership and for everything you and your incredible team has done. But of course, the work doesn't stop here. We are excited about the journey we will take as the partnership moves into a new phase. Melinda and Natalia outlined the facts clearly. There is so much at stake. We must harness what we have built together, protect our gains as COVID-19 continues to take its terrible toll and rise to the challenges and the opportunities of the coming decade. A girl born in 2012 will turn 18 in 2030. As she reaches that critical point in her life, let us make sure she has the tools to lead the healthy, prosperous life that she deserves. Let us make sure she has received a quality education so she can navigate the world. Let us make sure she has affordable access to quality services that prefer, prefer, provide her with what she wants and needs. And let us make sure she can make her own choices, that she has an equal stake in her society and its development. I am hopeful that together we can realise this vision for 2030. The UK stands with you for all our children. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Morton. I know I speak on behalf of all of my colleagues at the Secretary now and those who have worked with us over the years in expressing our appreciation for your remarks and for your support. This truly has been a partnership of so many people, people who work at DFID and now FCDO, at USAID, UNFPA and Gates, and so many partners around the world. And we couldn't have done it without your support. So thank you very much on, on behalf of all of us. Now it's my pleasure to share video remarks from some of our global partners and friends, demonstrating how the FP2020 partnership has worked across sectors to ensure we're addressing the needs of women and girls holistically. From there, my partner in leading FP2020 and a dear friend to me and many of you, Martin Smith, FP2020's Managing Director, will take us through this year's annual progress report, FP2020, The Arc of Progress. The Margaret Pike Trust's commitment to FP2020 is straightforward. We have committed to changing global environmental policy. Very unusually for an NGO with 50 years reproductive health expertise, we have observer status with both the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the UN Environment Assembly. We are the only member of IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, with 50 years family planning expertise. Now this is important because it's enabling us to actually work from inside both the biodiversity and the climate sectors, promoting the importance of reproductive health and rights. There are literally hundreds of billions of dollars available for climate adaptation. If we do more work promoting the importance of removing barriers to family planning for the climate, it might enable us to gain just a tiny fraction of those hundreds of billions for our work. 
there is a huge geographical overlap between priority communities for us and areas where the environmental sector works. Now, last year in 2020, we had one of our biggest successes. IUCN passed our resolution with an absolute landslide of governments, NGOs, and indigenous peoples organizations. And in 2021, and for the rest of the decade, we want to build on that. And FP2020 has helped us in several ways on its way, and I'd like to thank them for that. Globally, it's estimated that there are 130 million people who are in need of humanitarian aid, more than at any time since World War II. About a third of these people are women and girls of reproductive age who may have little or no access to contraception. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, the needs are just growing. People face an increased risk for unintended pregnancy, unsafe abortion and maternal mortality. Around the world, we're witnessing how restrictions on mobility have left people trapped with their abusers, leading to an alarming spike in gender-based violence. And not only is the need acute, but the demand for contraception in these settings is fierce. Across diverse contexts, 30 to 40% of women experiencing displacement did not want to become pregnant in the next two years. And despite all this, contraception still remains one of the most neglected and underfunded components of humanitarian response. Looking towards 2030, it's critical that we work together to ensure that all people affected by crisis have access to contraception and other essential sexual and reproductive health services. We need to build back more resilient and inclusive health systems that can withstand future pandemics, shocks, and future crises. We need to make sure that community-based groups and networks, especially women's groups, are at the table throughout preparedness planning and can be activated as soon as crises hit. COVID-19 should be a lesson to all countries that health is not an either or equation. We need to better prepare for emergencies, but also continue to invest in health systems that meet people's needs throughout the life course. I can't imagine the last several years of global health and particularly sexual reproductive health and rights programming without the work we've been privileged to do with FP 2020. It began in the midst of complicated activities. There was a trial seeking to explore whether a particular contraceptive method might actually be increasing the risk of HIV. That was not only an HIV issue, it was not only a contraceptive issue. It was an issue about women's health. It was an issue that brought FP 2020 and AVAC together in partnership with civil society groups around the world. Because at the end of the day, this is not about any one health issue. It is not about a technology. It's really about the individual. It's about the woman. And that's really what FP 2020 has done. It has helped bring a focus on keeping the individual at the center of this work. For 30 plus years in HIV, we've talked about integration, integrating sexual and reproductive health and HIV programming. And there have not been that many success stories that we can talk about. But I'm delighted that as FP 2020 looks to its future, that our collaboration around the ECHO trial and around understanding one woman, one body, one set of issues, one set of needs and wants and desires really is a hallmark of the future work together. Congratulations to everybody involved in FP 2020. And really more importantly, best of luck for the way forward. Although we've accomplished much, there is so much more to do and so much more to do together. We've heard from our inspiring executive director, Beth, uh, in celebrating the progress and successes of the FP 2020 partnership. And now we turn to our session on data highlights from the 2019, 2020 annual progress report, FP 2020, the arc of progress. In a few minutes, we'll move into a recorded session that will delve into the details of the data. But first, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Chris Elias, President of the Global Development Programme at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and co-chair of the FP2020 Reference Group to share his thoughts on the impact of the transformation in monitoring and data use that we have seen over the last eight years and how FP2020 has supported this work 
in partnership with a wide range of key stakeholders as a country-owned and country-led process. Over to you, Chris. Thank you, Martin. <clears throat> uh, before FFP 2020 was launched, the, the family planning community relied almost exclusively on periodic national health surveys typically conducted every five years to monitor progress. And often it took a year or two to analyze that data. So we were looking at data um, about the program that was often a couple of years old. So we were driving while looking in the rear view mirror, really. Um, and that's where I think that FP 2020 has been very transformative. The measurement agenda implemented in partnership with the performance monitoring and evidence working group, track 20 PMA and many other partners has transformed the data landscape. For example, instead of waiting five years or longer for new data, the FP 2020 core indicators are estimated and reported every year for every country and include the addition of, of service statistics. So the process of, and the process of doing this is country owned and country led so that each commitment making country now has a strengthened national data system for measuring its own progress. The 2020 progress report illustrates the success of this effort. It tells us that we've reached more women and girls. As of July, 2020, the total number of women and girls using a modern method of contraception in the 69 FP 2020 focus countries stood at 320 million, up from 260 million when the partnership was launched. Since 2012, an additional 60 million women and girls have chosen to use a modern method of contraception. We're able to more accurately monitor family planning financing as well. This year's report includes domestic expenditures for 54 of the 69 FP 2020 countries. This is a significant achievement for the family planning sector and a major success to build upon. The report also shows that donor governments are increasing their financing for family planning since 2012, reaching a high mark of $1.5 billion, both in 2018 and 2019. And new governments are emerging as, as consistent donors for the family planning programs. We're also using data more strategically. Countries can now use data to choose the right mix of investments that are appropriate for their situation and plan out detailed programs that will help them reach their evidence-based goals. And with a regular annual process in place to collect and analyze data, program managers can now track how their programs are performing and adjust their strategies. Over the past eight years, FP 2020 has developed better methods to track resource flows, contraceptive use, and expanded method choice for women and girls, all of which will continue to be critical levers to progress as we look forward to the next decade of family planning. These insights are possible because of the transformation the FP 2020 partners have brought to the data landscape for family planning. Almost all commitment making countries now have in place an annual process to review national and subnational data on family planning and produce estimates of key progress uh, markers. That is what we call the FP 2020 core indicators. We're seeing the application of these efforts in many ways. For example, the global financing facility has worked with track 20 in several countries to develop performance metrics and forecasts that inform project designs and financing with quality data and help track project achievements in country. Finally, I'd like to ex just extend my own personal huge thanks to Beth and to the entire FP 2020 Secretariat for their commitment and tireless efforts over the last eight years. It's been an incredible journey. And I look forward to the next 10 years as we work to achieve the SDGs by 2030. Continuing to improve our measurement and use of data will aid us on that path. And now I'd like to turn it back to Martin to discuss the annual progress report in greater detail. Thank you. Many thanks indeed, Chris. The next few minutes will expand on the key points Chris made concerning the progress of the partnership towards key goals over the last eight years, the impact of the FP 2020 partnership on data and measurement, and the continued advance of the measurement agenda as we move into the next decade. Our session is divided into three sections. Assessing progress. My colleague Jason Bremner and I will share key data from the 2019-2020 annual progress report, FP 2020, the arc of progress, 
focusing specifically on what the partnership has achieved since 2012 and progress over the past year. Our second section focuses on data use. Emily Sonneveld of Track 20 and Zenon Majani from Track 20 and the Ministry of Health in the Democratic Republic of Congo will be highlighting the increase in data availability and use in countries and its use for strategic decision making. And in our third section on the FP2020 measurement agenda, the co-leads of FP2020's performance monitoring and evidence working group will highlight the measurement efforts of the FP2020 partnership and the remaining challenges to address in the next measurement framework to 2030. But let's first turn to progress since 2012. And I'd like to introduce Jason Bremner, Director of Data and Performance Management at FP2020. Over to you, Jason. Thanks, Martin. At the outset of 2020, we knew it would be a challenge to present a complete picture of progress over the eight years of the partnership. Our process for data reporting begins early in each calendar year, and we're able to incorporate new data collected through the end of the previous year. A complete accounting of progress from 2012 to 2020 would only have been possible once most countries had completed new surveys. And this would have been a few years after the end of the FP2020 partnership. The emergence of COVID-19 has presented new challenges for progress reporting. While we've become accustomed to real-time data on COVID-19, our family planning indicators largely depend on household and facility surveys, and most of these are temporarily suspended. So this year's progress report provides a glimpse into progress prior to the onset of the pandemic. Today, I'll provide some brief highlights from the progress report, and I'll encourage you to uh, join tomorrow's progress report webinar for a deeper focus on the data, including early insights into COVID-19 impacts. What you see here is a graphic that shows the total number of contraceptive users by year across all the 69 FP2020 focus countries. You can see on the left side of the graphic that in 2012, there were approximately 260 million users of modern methods of contraception. And in each subsequent year, the total number of contraceptive users has grown. At the midpoint of 2020, we estimate that 320 million women and girls were using modern contraceptive methods. Comparing 2012 to 2020, you can see that we've reached 60 million additional users of contraception, or approximately half of the ambitious goal of 120 million additional users. Over the same period of time, the number of women of reproductive age has actually grown by about 15 million per year. So just keeping up with this population growth means that many more women and girls need family planning services each year just to maintain contraceptive prevalence. But in most FP2020 focused countries, modern contraceptive prevalence among all women is rising. And so countries are doing better than just keeping up. They're expanding the availability of services. Understanding this progress depends on looking at regional and individual country data. As of July 2020, the number of users of modern methods of contraception in Africa, for example, had grown by 66% since 2012, from 40 million to more than 66 million women and girls. This growth was most pronounced in Western and Central Africa, where the number of modern contraceptive users has doubled in just eight years. And in Eastern and Southern Africa, where the number of users has grown by 70%. At a country level, 14 countries have each added more than 1 million additional users of modern contraception since 2012. In 13 countries, the number of users of modern methods has doubled since 2012. One area of focus of the FP2020 partnership has been the expansion of method availability and choices. This graphic shows changes over time in method mix based on the most common method and the second most common method in use in countries. The upper two bars are comparing the most commonly used method prior to 2012 and now in a later time period. And the lower two bars are showing the second most common method. This graphic illustrates in particular the emergence of implants shown here in yellow. 
Prior to 2012, implants were not commonly used, but today they have emerged as the most commonly used method in several countries, shown in the upper two bars. And the second most common method in a large number of countries, uh, which are shown in those lower two bars. Also emerging, but not shown in this graphic, is the increasing availability of self-injection as another choice. A final and important question is whether FP2020's 120 million additional users goal has exacerbated inequities or led to a prioritization of easier to reach populations. To answer this question, we're examining data for signs of inequity in contraceptive gains, looking at wealth groups, levels of education, age, marital status, and urban or rural residents. This figure illustrates just one of these comparisons showing change in modern contraceptive prevalence among wealth groups between two surveys in Malawi. You can see both the gains among the lowest wealth groups shown here in the difference between the blue uh, large circle <clears throat> and a narrowing of inequity in contraceptive use among wealth groups. Overall, our results highlight that gains were seen among relatively disadvantaged groups, including rural women, the least educated, the poorest, and the youngest. Contrary to the early concerns of the family planning community, the impact of the FP2020 partnership on equity appears to be positive, reinforcing the importance of country-specific commitments, policies, and programming that seeks to reach underserved populations. So now I'll turn it back to Martin, thanks. Thanks very much, Jason. When FP2020 was launched in 2012, the partnership recognized the urgent need for better tracking and monitoring of resource flows in the sector. And an immense amount of work has happened in this area. In 2019, bilateral family planning funding from donor governments totaled $1.52 billion, on par with the 2018 disbursements of $1.49 billion. Donor government funding for family planning has generally risen since the London summit of 2012, although there have been fluctuations over the period. In 2019, funding was more than $400 million above the 2012 amount. In addition to bilateral donors, private foundations have also contributed substantial and increased resources to family planning over the period. The US was the largest bilateral donor to family planning in 2019, accounting for 39% of the total bilateral funding. The UK was the second largest donor at 25%, followed by the Netherlands at 13%, Sweden at 7%, and Canada at 6%. Total family planning expenditures in 2018, the most recent year for which domestic government expenditures are available, are estimated to be 4.4 billion US dollars across all FP2020 countries. International donors contributed an estimated 48%, domestic governments 35%, and consumers 17%. These proportions vary greatly for different countries, of course. This is FP2020's third year of reporting domestic expenditures at the country level, with the number of countries for which estimates are available increasing each year. This year's table includes estimates for 54 countries amounting to nearly $1.6 billion in spending. It should be noted that five countries, Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Pakistan and the Philippines, account for 82% of domestic government expenditures on family planning shown here. And so we turn to the data use, the second section of our presentation. It's my great pleasure to hand over to Emily Sonnevelt, the director of the Track 20 project at Avenir Health, who will speak more to the impact of the FB2020 partnership on data and measurement. Over to you, Emily. Over the past nine years, Track 20 has worked to expand and improve the use of family planning data at the country and global levels. The FP2020 initiative provided an opportunity to galvanize around data, and Track 20 has been thrilled to be a part of that process. This has included leading methodological advances, including developing new methodologies, tools, and indicators, and then standardizing these across countries and globally, and importantly, prioritizing the expansion and use of family planning service statistics, 
The central part of our work is a network of ME officers that sit in governments across Africa and Asia within countries that have made commitments to FP2020. These ME officers work to improve the availability, quality, and use of family planning data. This includes, in many countries, improving the family planning environment within their own HMIS systems. All of this work contributes to more and more effective use of family planning data. Track 20 prioritizes supporting countries to have the data they need when they need it so it can be strategically leveraged to support decision making. This often includes creating innovative, interactive, and user-friendly tools and models that governments can engage with directly. These models are often embedded within existing government processes to ensure that the data use is ongoing. The collective work of these ME officers and their colleagues with the leadership of their supervisors and family planning programs has improved the family planning data environment. It provides an opportunity to leverage it moving forward. We look forward to the next decade of family planning and how much we can collectively achieve. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Zenin Mujani, an ME officer from the DRC, where he will have an opportunity to talk a little bit about how this process has changed the work that he does. Thank you. Pour ce qui concerne l'amélioration de la compréhension des données ou indicateurs de planification familiale, il faut savoir que au début, mon pays, moi et beaucoup d'autres experts, nous avions des difficultés à bien comprendre les données de planification familiale, notamment les utilisatrices additionnelles, les APC, les, la prévalence contraceptive, les besoins satisfaits, les besoins non satisfaits et même le vote et calcul. Mais les différentes formations que nous avons reçues avec TAC20, ça a été un grand apport parce que ça nous a aidé à bien comprendre la compréhension, à bien comprendre euh, ces indicateurs. Alors, le deuxième élément, c'est que euh, pour faire notre travail au quotidien, on disait chaque fois que la RDC a un problème de qualité de données, mais on ne savait pas de façon spécifique dire quel est le problème en rapport avec la qualité de données, quelle est l'ampleur et c'est dans quel coin du pays où les problèmes se posent le plus. On n'était pas assez outillé, comme vous savez, la RDC c'est un cluster et qui a 26 provinces et plus de 17 000 formations sanitaires. Donc, faire une analyse de la qualité des données, ça demande de disposer des outils adaptés et une méthodologie adaptée. Et donc, c'est là où Tractin nous a beaucoup aidé en mettant à notre disposition l'outil sps 2 qui est l'outil que nous avons le plus utilisé, parce que dans nos estimations, la RDC ne pouvait pas utiliser ces données de routine. Nous avons donc utilisé le sps 2 pour mettre en évidence les problèmes de qualité et qui se pose avec nos données de planification familiale et aussi avoir un contenu de feedback aux provinces. Et ça ne s'est pas arrêté là. Nous avons été à mesure de former les provinciaux pour que chaque province, à son tour, puisse aussi utiliser le ss 2 et préparer le feedback aux différentes zones de santé. L'exercice a été très intéressant parce que la pluie de tracteurs à travers les ateliers de consensus qui regroupent les participants de provinces. Nous avons dû partager longuement avec eux sur les analyses des qualités des données et le feedback à faire aux provinces. Et fort de cette expérience, TRAC20 a eu à nous demander de pouvoir appuyer à son temps le Tchad, la Côte d'Ivoire et le Togo. Et nous avons aussi beaucoup appris d'eux par rapport à la qualité des données. FP2020's Performance Monitoring and Evidence Working Group are a group of global measurement experts and a key part of FP2020. Back in 2012, they established a set of core indicators that provided our annual global readout of key progress markers across countries. And over the last several years, they've continued to address measurement issues and improvements needed in the family planning field. Data and evidence-informed decision-making continue to be central to our next decade indeed. So we're now delighted to hear from the co-leads of the PME Working Group to share a word about this effort and the continuing work of the PME Working Group. Hello, I'm Eileen Spicer from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Hello everyone, I'm Polentra from IPPF Africa Regional Office. Hi, I'm Sarah Bradley from Apt Associates. As you have heard from other speakers, since 2012, FP2020 and its measurement partners have worked to harmonize and align reporting, improve indicators and methodologies, and develop the annual progress report that has just been presented. 
Over the years, FP2020 and its measurement partners have also published commentaries on measurement, established additional indicators and data sets to promote measurement alignment, and most recently have worked on a measurement learning series, all of which can be found on the FP2020 Data Hub. The FP2020 Performance Monitoring and Evidence Working Group that I have been honored to be part of and that with my fellow co-leads we are representing today has been central to these efforts. This group of family planning measurement experts from implementing partners, academia, donors, and multilateral agencies provides technical advice and support for monitoring progress towards FP2020's goals, promotes the use of data for programming, advocacy, and decision making, and contributes to the strengthening of evidence in key dimensions of family planning. This group developed FP2020's measurement framework that informs all of these efforts. Application of FP2020 measurement framework has led to important contribution to the field of family planning. For example, the global community now monitors modern contraceptive use among all women of reproductive age, rather than just married and in union women, and this has helped to refocus the global family planning agenda. Measuring, monitoring, and reporting Modern contraceptive use for all women reinforces the right of all women to use contraception. It requires countries and global partners to examine trends in contraceptive use among the broader population, not just the married women, and encourages policymakers to develop specific programs for the different contraceptive needs of married and unmarried women and adolescent girls. The FP2020 measurement framework has always been a living document with indicators added and adjusted over time. In the next phase of the partnership, the Performance Monitoring and Evidence Working Group is updating the framework and its indicators to measure contraceptive use more holistically, making central women's and girls' choices to use or not use contraception, measuring the health system that provides contraception, and the policy and regulatory environment that supports women and makes it possible for them to use a method of their choice. We're tackling the challenge of how to better measure the essential issues of equity, informed choice, and quality of care, and calling for the addition of uncertainty intervals to our estimates. Together, these advancements will improve our understanding, give us new tools to measure progress, and bring to life FP2020's commitment to family planning and ensuring the primacy of women's choice. Across the 69 FP2020 focus countries, modern contraceptive prevalence has risen by more than two percentage points since 2012, a significant success story. This insight and a myriad others are possible because of the transformation FP2020 partners have brought to the data landscape for family planning. There will continue to be many challenges ahead, including those that are being posed by COVID-19 yet we are resolute in charting our measurement course for the next decade to continue to harmonize and align reporting, improve indicators and methodologies, and enhance the infrastructure and capacity to generate and use robust data for decision-making in the service of our 2030 vision. MSI is one of the world's largest providers of reproductive health care, working across 37 country programs. Since 2012, MSI has delivered family planning services to over 11 million additional users worldwide, contributing to 9% of FP2020's overall target. Over the next decades, we hugely look forward to continuing our collaboration with FP2020 to make reproductive choice a reality for all. FP2020 is done in Bangladesh uh, through implementation of USAID flagship program, accelerating universal access to family planning, also known as Sukhijiban, has been providing technical support to the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare agencies in achieving overarching goal to increase community accessibility. Apoiamos os direitos das mulheres e das adolescentes de decidir livremente e por si se quando e quantas crianças querem elas ter, 
Apoiamos a Direção Nacional da Saúde Pública na primeira campanha de comunicação sobre saúde reprodutiva dirigida aos adolescentes angolanos, com forte ênfase digital e criada desde o início com os adolescentes angolanos. A parceria com a iniciativa FP 2020 acelerou este trabalho, permitindo o um enfoque nas respostas às necessidades da saúde reprodutiva dos adolescentes angolanos. Com a parceria da Unitel, levamos esse projeto a lar de acolhimento e os resultados são encorajadores. Por exemplo, após a visualização do primeiro vídeo no lar de acolhimento dos adolescentes em Luanda, 40% dos adolescentes conhecia todos os métodos contraceptivos, quando antes do vídeo, nenhum deles sabia da existência dos métodos contraceptivos. By working from home, I get to continue managing the creation and publication of social media contents, especially as it talks about modern contraceptive methods and how to access it during quarantine. Also giving tips and advices on how to stay safe and healthy and giving importance to their own mental health during this crisis. And I'm also able to engage and talk to them about their reproductive health and their family planning choices. Mon organisation améliore l'accès aux services de planification familiale en organisant des séances d'échange et orientation sur la nécessité du recours à une méthode de contraception adéquate. Le partenariat Family Planning 2020 a changé notre environnement autour du planning familial en nous dotant des informations nouvelles et expériences ailleurs. In the last implementation year of FP 2020, uh, Indonesia has managed to achieve some of the FP 2020 commitments including the commitments related to the budget allocation, supply chain management, and South-South uh, exchange uh, activities. In terms of family planning commitment, FP2020 are not to be seen as a separate initiative from the government program. It should be aligned with Indonesia's uh, national priorities or to global commitments, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. The COVID-19 crisis is also putting a lot of adolescents and young people at the risk of, uh, you know, uh, becoming victims of sexual violence, um, domestic violence. To mitigate a lot of these challenges, some of the uh, methods that civil society organizations have been using is uh, to advocate for, uh, you know, telemedicine, uh, increased emphasis on telemedicine, uh, a lot of um, helplines uh, to start integrating information on SRH, including family planning, as essential information to be given during this time. It's been inspiring to hear the impact of the partnership shared by so many over the course of this morning's event. Though we still have much work ahead, we're motivated by the progress that we have made. As many have noted, 60 million additional women and girls in the 69 lowest income countries have chosen to use family planning. Young people are engaged throughout the partnership at all levels, including in the reference group, though there is still room to improve on all of this. Family planning has been included in the minimum initial service package for reproductive health in crisis settings. FP 2020, with many partners, launched a sexual reproductive health preparedness toolkit a few months ago. And governments are ensuring that family planning is an essential service in their COVID-19 response plans. Family planning programs are increasingly funded locally, including through the global financing facility and country investment cases in many places. And voluntary rights-based family planning services and policies are increasingly at the forefront of global conversations and advocacy, now more critically than ever as we consider issues of racial, gender, and reproductive justice. We're excited about all that the future holds. 
Many of you have been part of the global consultation we've held over the last two years in which we asked what you want to see for the next phase of this partnership. Together, we crafted a vision framework that will underpin all of our efforts. Over the past year, we've crafted a new partnership architecture and governance structure to align with this vision. And today, we officially kick off the transition to the next decade. To start this new decade and this new chapter of Family Planning Partnership, it arrives during a period of dramatic changes. In 2020, if 2020 has proven anything, it's that we, can continue, we can't continue with business as usual. The pandemic has created and exacerbated challenges, including access to contraception. It also has demonstrated the opportunities we have to do things in new and better ways. The family planning community is and must be a part of the larger reckoning of power and representation in our field. As we enter this new chapter, our partnership will look and function differently and will be more directly shaped by the communities closest to the challenges we're trying to solve and those with the lived experiences to get us there. Family planning remains one of the most powerful, powerful tools to ensure that women and communities thrive. This remains our motivation. After much, consider after much consideration and consultation with many of you, as you may have noticed sprinkled throughout this event today, we are pleased to officially announce the next partnership will be called FP2030. We're grateful for all the efforts spent mobilizing around the FP2020 partnership, and we do not want to lose that momentum. But we also want to signal that we're moving forward in a new direction. While we hope to be able to officially launch the fully crafted partnership at this year's International Conference on Family Planning, should the COVID-19 pandemic be under control by that time, I'm excited to introduce five key changes we'll make in 2021. And I'm very pleased to do this with my colleague, Dilly Severin, FP2020 Senior Director for Global Initiatives. Together, we'll look at FP2030's leadership, reach, structure, accountability, and goals. So I'll kick us off with leadership. FP2030 will be led by a new governing board with shared decision-making responsibilities among all, not just funders and donors. This group will reflect the wealth of voices, experiences, and viewpoints critical to the success of family planning programs everywhere. That's why we're inviting civil society partners, advocates, and especially youth leaders to join Applications for the governing board will open in a few months, and I hope you'll consider applying. Over to you, Dilly. Thanks, Beth. I'll be talking about the partnership's reach. Since 2012, FB2020 partners have supported our 69 focus countries to meet their family planning commitments. Moving forward, we're embracing a more inclusive model by opening the partnership to any country that wishes to participate. Countries are free to join and are encouraged to shape both their commitments and their accountability mechanisms alongside local advocates and experts, including many of you. This will not be one size fits all in our approach. Um, so our support will be designed around each country's needs. Already over 20 countries are poised to make new commitments as they join our new family planning partnership. We hope many others will follow in their footsteps. Beth, back to you to talk structure. Thank you. The tailored model Dilly introduced will, re will require support tailored to different contexts. For this reason, we're shifting from a centralized secretariat based in Washington, D.C. to five regional hubs, one in each of East and Southern Africa, West and Central Africa, Asia, Latin America and the Caribbean, and North America and Europe. These hubs will engage directly with the partners and governments in their regions, which we hope will be more will lead to more opportunities for collaboration. In the coming months, we'll be inviting organizations to apply to host a regional hub, and we will announce these hubs at ICFP. And as part of this transition, I'll be stepping down as executive director of FB 2020 um, at the midpoint of this year, and we're starting the search in the coming weeks for a new executive director who will oversee the 2030 partnership. Thanks, Beth. I'll give a little bit of a preview into accountability. Um, so data rights and accountability have been a, the backbone of our partnership, um, and they will continue to be the foundation of FB 2030. Expanding on the successes and lessons from the last eight years, FB 2030 will be even stronger and more inclusive with a localized structure 
and a built-in foundations of rights, equity, and mutual accountability. Um, FP 2030 is establishing a robust commitment-making process that strengthens the role of civil society. This includes equitable partnerships with adolescents and youth and requires a framework of mutual accountability from the start. Beth, I'll let you talk about goals. Great. Everyone knows that eight years ago, we made a promise to ensure that 120 million additional women and girls would have access to con the contraceptives they want and need. Today, we made it halfway to that goal, even as the COVID-19 pandemic has slowed our progress. Um, but as we move ahead, FP 2030 will continue to serve as a knowledge platform and to track progress against our many shared goals beyond our 2020 deadline. We're also expanding our aspirations as we look to the future. We know that long-term progress will be measured not just in the number of women using contraceptives, but on how we embrace the values that ensure women are able to exercise that right. We're committed to promoting the social and cultural norms that afford women the agency to determine and to realize their reproductive intentions. We're committed to ensuring that all women, regardless of age or income, have reproductive choices and can access quality service designed with their needs in mind. We'll also continue to work with many of our traditional partners. Um, we've had not had time to feature today, like the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition, advocacy partners such as AFP and the Gates Institute, and private and corporate sector partners, like those um, working with the UN Foundation, FP 2020's host, and the Universal Access Pro Project. And finally, we're committed to continuing to build stronger ties with other sectors, like those working on HIV and climate change and humanitarian actors, to ensure family planning programs are resilient and reflective of the realities of the lives of women and all people who need and want access to contraception in all their complexity and diversity without judgment or bias. This expanded vision will require an expanded partnership committed to ensuring sexual and reproductive rights are respected and women's voices are heard. So Dilly, it'd be a pleasure if you'd share with us the commitments process going forward. Sure, I'm happy to share some of that with our viewers today, Beth. Uh, starting today, FB 2030 will be welcoming commitments from governments and other partners on a rolling basis based on their timelines and priorities. On February 8th, um, I'm pleased to announce that um, FP 2030 will, will launch a comprehensive commitments microsite, which contains detailed guidance for governments, donors, civil society, uh, the private sector, and other partners. Um, FP 2030, of course, will highlight commitments throughout the year, including during global moments like the Generation Equality Forum in the summer. And at the end of 2021, hopefully uh, at, the, at the International Conference on Family Planning, as well as through other products, webinars, and convenings. Um, so Beth, back to you. We've covered a lot of ground, uh, a pretty exciting day. Uh, I hope you're feeling really good. <laughs> I am, I hope you are as well. And I know Secretariat and so many partners around the world are participating. There's a lively conversation going on online on the hashtag MyFPStory. So we do continue everybody to, or continue to encourage everybody to participate. And Dilly, it's been a pleasure to do this session with you and to work with you as well. So I'm excited to hear about the panel that uh, you'll be moderating next. Thanks, Beth. And I've seen a lot of questions already about equity and some of the, the topics that this next panel addresses. Um, so um, without further ado, you know, I've already hinted at FB 2020's approach and evolution with respect to data rights and accountability. Uh, first launching as a partnership uh, in 2012 with Data at the Center and a goal of reaching 120 million additional users to then embracing and becoming a normative force around a rights-based family planning approach. Um, throughout each of those progressive changes, the accountability approach of the partnership remained grounded in a framework focused on transparency and visibility of commitments and progress on commitments through data and our annual progress reports. Of course, strengthened by structures such as the reference group, government and donor focal points, as well as the Track 20 monitoring and evaluation officers. The last evolution we saw was around the recognition of, of, of the critical role of civil society and youth in fulfilling rights. And we saw that reflected in the addition of civil society and youth focal points, uh, Comfort mentioned this earlier, as well as the addition of youth reference group members. So during the next 30 minutes, I'll be asking longtime FP 2020 partners and reference group members to share their reflections on how the partnership has changed with respect to data, rights, and accountability. 
So I'm excited to welcome our illustrious uh, panel today, some of whom are reference group members and all of whom are longtime partners of FB 2020 to have a conversation um, around data rights and accountability. So joining us are uh, Latanya Mopfret, who is the president and CEO of the Global Fund for Women, uh, Mansa Priya Basudevan, uh, who's a youth advocate who is uh, sitting on our FB 2020 reference group, uh, Ramachandra Gaire, who is one of the founders of the Blind Youth Association of Nepal, and Simon Cook, who is the CEO of MSI Reproductive Choices. Welcome. And our new partnership really has a strength and focus on country ownership and accountability. So the question now is what next and how do we use this focus on accountability to really respond to not only the sustainable development goals, but this moment we're in where there's increased focus and conversation on decolonizing development, reproductive justice, and equity. And so I wonder, Latanya, you know, if you could start us off with setting the big picture on the movement towards reproductive justice and perhaps how this partnership and the next partnership, the 2030 partnership, could be thinking about this. Um, so the Global Fund for Women, you know, says that gender justice movements are some of the most effective ways to sustain long-term change. How does the Global Fund address reproductive justice? Um, Global Fund for Women, as you know, for more than 30 years has been funding bold women's rights organizations around the world. We recently shifted into a movement approach that supports gender justice movements specifically to make decisions um, on what resources they need to be strong, connected, and, and quite frankly, impactful. Um, and this builds on the power of local collective uh, organizing to address the systemic shifts that I think we need to advance gender justice. And we did this because the research shows that broad-based social movements, as I think you were mentioning, um, it tends to create and sustain this long-term social transformation. But yet these movements are consistently underfunded and, and funders have struggled to effectively meet their needs. So what it means is tangibly that we have to allow for movements to determine their own needs at the moments when they need it and fund accordingly. Through movement committees, we think we can do that. It's a type of participatory grant making. Um, it allows us to listen to what's happening with, uh, with, our or with the organizations um, that we partner with. And um, it allows us then to, as a feminist fund, to shift power and privilege in a way uh, you know, and not just how you fund, but what you fund. And so, you know, practically it means giving money to, giving more money to marginalized communities to create the change that they're seeking. It means acknowledging and a, a transformational social change must come from agendas and movements that are led by these most impacted and marginalized. And then our grants are flexible and often multi-year and allow for maximum flexibility. This was really helpful during COVID so that women's organizations and movements can move uh, their resources in order to address the pandemic. And then intersectional work. And so I know while reproductive justice is a lot of um, uh, work is happening with collective movements around the world, um, we also know that that reproductive justice is not in a silo. It means that there are other things happening in their economic lives and other health um, situations that they have um, in you know, education and in other areas that we also, as um, I think FP 2020 have to move forward in looking at the entire spectrum of needs that particularly women have, women and girls, so that we can address those things holistically with them as partners. Right. I'll stop there. Mansa. What do you think is most needed in a 2030 partnership with respect to the meaningful partnership and engagement of adolescents and youth? How do we address some of those power dynamics and those funding issues that Latanya just uh, flagged for us? Thanks, Dilly, for that question. I want to be able to uh, look back at the partnership um, and really sort of think through how inclusive we were and then uh, move on to talk about how um, equitable we were, right? Um, so the partnership structure, devolution, and the goal of 120 uh, million wasn't set by all stakeholders. Ownership towards an agenda that wasn't set by us, that is the youth constituency, was tough to forge. It did sometimes feel like youth were called in to support an agenda that had already taken flight. However, in 2018, um, I think that's when I first kind of interacted with 
the partnership and um, we made our first move towards formal institutionalization and integration of youth advocates on tables of power and decision making that traditionally don't feed you. Capacity building sessions, comprehensive orientations and networking meetings followed um, and these really did facilitate the partnership, um, you know, the uh, meaningful participation of young people in the form of youth-led organizations and youth focal points in subsequent iterations of the country action plans. Um, there was, there was, you know, there was a fair amount of engagement and to that extent, enabling environment was facilitated for young people to participate and steer the partnership. Was there power sharing? Was it equitable? And that's something I really want to reflect on. And so in the next phase of the partnership, if the goal, and it should be the goal, is in fact equal stakeholdership and partnership, then youth must have something to put on that table. And that's on us. The onus is on the partnership and the global community to ensure that we're not building merely symbolic tokenistic partnerships, but intentionally empowering young people to meaningfully and equally participate. We knew of youth focal points who didn't have enough money to um, travel from one province to the other to be able to participate in focal point meetings. We knew of youth focal points who took up pro bono work alongside existing commitments in order to be able to put their time, efforts and labor on the table. The fact of the matter is that these partnerships are not in and of themselves equal. These are inherently unequal partnerships that we will have to invest in so that we bring all partners onto a level playing field. Besides, investing in youth is perhaps the most fundamental way to build sustainable gains for the family planning movement. Um, to build sustainability, we would have to go beyond the small project-based grants mechanisms that tend to ensure that grassroots and youth-led organizations remain just that, small scale, um, and really seek to galvanize instruments that are directed at core funding for organizational and personal development so that we are fortifying our present and our futures. Thanks so much, Mansa. And I also share your, your hope um, and your commitment. I think um, the new structure of the partnership, as well as some of these efforts that you're highlighting around, including um, adolescents and, and, and youth from the beginning in, in the commitment making process, but also implementation process, um, will go a long way to, to some of the, the mandate that you've given us. But I agree that more attention to how we actually invest and fund in the fund the engagement of adolescents and youth is something we still need to work on. I wonder if I could turn to uh, Ram to talk a bit more about this concept that our panelists have been raising so far in terms of key constituencies having equitable power to shape policies and programs and that being at the heart of the ability of those programs to be scaled up um, and for those constituencies to be empowered. I'm gonna ask you a question in relation to that as it, as it um, links to data, because I know you have done a lot of work in your role at, um, at the Blind Youth Association of Nepal in terms of addressing data gaps. What have you been able to do to address data gaps that were inhibiting advocacy uh, for, for the constituency that you were working with? Thank you, Delhi. When it comes to the data and disability, there is always a huge gap because nobody has authentic data. So when we see the government data, that is much, much differ to the global uh, projection of the data on disability. Okay, global reports say that there is around 10 to 15 percent of the total population have some form of disability. But the census report of the government shows less than 2 percent. It is particularly due to the lack of data recording system and misrepresentation and the disguise of the disability population because lack of education and lack of awareness and level of low acceptance among the community and the family resulted low data generation. As a result, it is very difficult for us to do our advocacy work on claiming our rights. Because in total number, the disability number is very, very low. Because mostly the visible disability, for example, physical disability, blindness, or the deaf are very much countable. But there are so many invisible disabilities, such as developmental disabilities, autism, intellectual disabilities, or other kinds of, you know, moderate disabilities are not 
even considered in the data system, which is resulting very much disparity in terms of service and opportunity distribution. So one of the things that our association involving with other cross disability organization is very much advocating through the human rights and justice center approach. Because to offer any service for people with disabilities, this should be issue of human rights or person center issue. Or we should treat through the justice system. That means even though the number is very less, the human rights or the justice should not be undermined just due to lack of data. So one of our advocacy effort, which is very much resulting is person-centric approach and the human rights approach. So we believe in one in totality. One individual should be treated as a full and complete. So this is how we are working and very much advocating for the data generation. Many people talk there is a lack of data, but focus is very much less given to generate the data. It is progressing, but in a slow pace. I stop daily there. Thanks, Ram. Um, some really important insights here between on the, the tension between generating data and this uh, human rights focus um, and a human rights approach. Simon, I know that MSI grapples with all of these issues. Um, in terms of how to provide access to all clients, whatever their background, um, without stigma and by removing as many barriers as possible. What do you think uh, are the biggest lessons as someone who has been part of the partnership for the last eight years that we have seen around operationalizing rights based family planning? And what, are, what, what of these lessons should we be most mindful of for the 2030 partnership to, to change our approach? There's been a huge amount of progress made. And if, if, if you go back to IC, um, uh, PD 1994, uh, family planning was actually a very controversial subject at that time. Um, and now you see it much more mainstreamed and you see changes in um, um, approaches to safe abortion provision, which obviously MSI is at the center of. You see what's happened in Argentina, you see what's happened in Ireland. So I would say there's a very strong uh, direction which is being led by women and being the, those most affected by these issues. Um, and that's, uh, I'd like to think, unstoppable, but it is actually reversible in the short term, as we've seen over the last four years as well. So the, the, the key for me would be to stay the course. I think FP2020 has made some very um, important strides in terms of um, accelerating uh, focus at national country level on uh, um, uh, SRHR, which, uh, which obviously includes rights. It's, it's, it's very important that we don't necessarily ask everybody to, to adhere to every value that we may all have, but, the, but we ask them to make progress towards uh, removing barriers and creating access and reducing stigma. And we as MSI, we, we have been working in communities where, where our client base is heavily stigmatized for, for many, many years. But because we have an advo advocacy by doing approach, we take the view that you don't have to agree with us and you don't necessarily have to support every aspect of what you do, but you must allow choice. And you must allow women to exercise that choice. And uh, because everything that we are doing is connected to public health and um, safety, it's really about, about creating better health outcomes for women and girls in difficult circumstances. So really stay the course so to the international donors who may be uh, moved away from focus on family planning because of many other important things like climate, um, climate resilience, climate change, and of course the, the, um, the pandemic. Um, it's extremely important that we don't let uh, what's happened in the last four years uh, uh, continue and also not, not to, frankly, to put it bluntly, to let Trump win at the last mile because a lot of the uh, reverses that we've seen over the last few months and years will take quite a long time to undo. Uh, we said the direction is, is continuous and is going in the right direction. But this is all about removing stigma. It's all about uh, allowing women and girls to make those choices. And many, as I said, absolutely it's about uh, if you want uh, young people to access contraception services, they must be included in the, in the discussion and the, the debate. Uh, and really to, in, the, in the respect to reproductive justice is to allow everybody, whoever they are or however they identify to access those services without judgment. And uh, we do, for example, in, in, in our clinics in the UK and Australia, we have pathways for, for trans men 
to access abortion services. And I know that these are infinitesimally small numbers, but we still think it's critically important that everybody who wants to access a service uh, has a bespoke pathway that is suitable for them and their needs. Thanks, Simon. Uh, speaking of common ground, Tanya, you have reminded us of the importance of intersectionality, that maybe sometimes we are very much focused on family planning and reproductive justice, but we need to broaden our lens. Um, so building off of Simon's comments about that common ground, can you talk about intersectionality, how the fund has approached this, and particularly as it relates to accountability? Um, what should a partnership like the 2030 partnership be thinking about in terms of, um, for lack of a pun, that intersection between intersectionality and accountability? Thanks, Dilly. And just, you know, thinking about all the words that my colleagues here have, have talked about, um, it's, it, you know, for us, it's, we, we believe deeply that funding women in marginalized communities is going to create the change that, that we see. And in, in this funding, I think we have to prioritize leadership of historically marginalized communities. And that includes racial, religious minorities, queer and gender non-conforming folks. And, and this is critical, critical that it's community led this approach. And we do it because, I mean, it's the right thing to do, of course, but it's also the best way, as I, I stated earlier, to create that lasting change that we're talking about. I mean, you know, overall the, uh, you know, our grant making philosophy is to shift power and privilege, as I said, um, from a few into equity and equality for all. And in that, statement is actually rooted in intersectionality. Um, there is no gender justice without racial justice, without climate justice, without economic justice. And the, the movement led approach from our perspective um, outlines um, this shift. Um, and, you know, and, and when we have people who are most affected by the problem actually as the solution, um, and, and our colleagues have talked about that with young people, but I would stretch that to any um, groups that are, are going to be affected, that they're part of the solution. And I think when we talk about data and accountability, it really um, hones in because the, the collection of that data, as our colleague was saying, um, and the utilization of that data for activism and advocacy um, actually is at the community level. So it's gonna be crucial um, if we want governments to spend more money on family planning, on safe abortion, then that we actually support the community to make those demands from their governments. We just had an inauguration here in the United States. I understand that uh, President Biden will um, repeal the, this deadly um, global gag rule um, and how important it's gonna be for us to ensure that other countries do not dictate um, to uh, the countries that they support and provide resources to the laws in their own country. And that was ultimately what happened. We have to, you know, think about the patriarchy, um, the colonialism that has, has built the systems that we have today and try very hard not to repeat those same mistakes. And quite frankly, the global gag rule is part of that. That is telling a country about their own laws and holding, um, the US and other donor countries responsible for the outcomes of their own laws on the organizations and communities that um, uh, are supported by their resources, I think is gonna be hugely important for FB 20, 2030 as we go forward. Iman, so I wonder if I can turn to you um, to pick up a bit on this theme of the, the data accountability and the utilization of data. You've, you've often said that um, Adolescents and youth in some ways are, are a data impoverished community. How do you think a global partnership like the 23rd Me Partnership can move beyond conventional metrics to understand and communicate impact? In the information society that we live in today, barely anyone can escape from the purview of big data. So, you know, tech companies have data on us about everything under the sun. However, when it comes to sexual and reproductive health and rights, the social, political, and cultural stigma against or denial of adolescent sexuality and sexual autonomy has led to very little information around young people's sexual behaviors, preferences, choices, relationships, and everything within the pleasure spectrum, which has been tactically then divorced from the family planning discourse, even mm -hmm. though it's the other half of the reality, especially for adolescents and youth. And this is tenuous terrain because if we were to collect successfully 
and publish data around the same sensitive issues, we could evince that adolescent and youth needs are the same as everybody else and make decisions around financing for and ensuring these needs. But at the same time, the processes of data collection and publication could vulnerabilize adolescent and youth populations whose lives are highly regulated by patriarchal paternalistic institutions and societal norms. In some instances, we aren't exactly data rich, but there is considerable data around school drop-offs, around child marriage, around sexual violence, trafficking, livelihoods, employment, quality of life. So we do have a wealth of organizations, right from INGOs like Marie Stokes to grassroots youth-led organizations that engage in qualitative and quantitative studies. Um, and especially during COVID-19, we've had a swell of studies um, around most marginalized populations access to sexual and reproductive health services. Um, and a global multi-stakeholder partnership like FP 2030 would be uniquely placed to leverage the strength of its diverse constituencies to be able to tell fuller, more comprehensive stories. Um, I do think it's important in the next phase of the partnership for us also to place equal emphasis on discourse as much as we place on data so that we move from just securing supply to ensuring demand. And we have enough data to build very strong discourse that evidences the criticality of contraception among other aspects for adolescents to be able to negotiate their socioeconomic empowerment. And that's the discourse we need to be building and amplifying. Without that discourse, it's strategically, you know, that discourse that strategically builds back the multi-sectoral linkages that lend adolescent family planning socio-political sanction we cannot oust the very stigma that prevents this data from surfacing in the first place. So in order to have the data, we need the discourse, and we can't possibly solve the issue of lack of data with data. A powerful statement there about you can't solve the problem of data with data. That's great. Um, I, I wonder, um, Ram, if I could, um, as we're, we're starting to close up, um, have you reflect on some of the pieces that all of our panelists have highlighted here in terms of intersectionality, but also the broader role of, of the funding environment, policies like the global gag rule, for example, that um, may be harming um, communities. What's needed for government donors and civil society to truly deliver on person-centered care? People with disability and their acceptance is very, very low, unfortunately. Low from the family, community, government side, and unfortunately also from the global community. I cannot blame that it's intentional ignorance, but lack of accessibility, lack of attention, and lack of commitment is leading to the low acceptance that obviously lead to the low service uptake and low level of dignified life among the persons with disabilities. So. Let me give you just one example. When we were running our project on inclusive SRHR program for young persons with disability in Nepal under FE 2020, we realized that when we are working with cross-sectionality of the disability and the diverse group, we found that there are less than 100 words that are developed in sign language to communicate for deaf people. And when it comes to the people with intellectual disability, autism, or people with severe disability, we all realize that the sexual needs are, is there among those community. But when we link that needs to the rights, they are not able to enjoy their, those rights. And it is particularly happening because there is a low acceptance among the all level which is resulting these things. So why this is low acceptance is there's a very lack of discourse on disability. It's hardly able to find the literature on disability and sexuality because so far the discourse on disability and sexuality is very much less happening. So I think when we talk about the 2030 agenda or leave no one behind, I think it's right time for us to rethink and re-modified our programs, approach, and the funding modality. I think we need to rethink about the data or the commitment, the programs that are assuring and including the all people with all section or all cross-sectionality and intersectionality. Are we really becoming inclusive? 
our programs are we developing in accessible way where everyone can enjoy their rights adopting accessibility components so that these things can really translate to enjoy the dignified life and that can assure through the reproductive justice for which the discourse on disability and real inclusion is very much needed. Thanks so much, Ram. Um, so Simon, I'm gonna give you the last word here um, as we close out our session. So I think we have some really powerful statements around discourse. Um, without discourse, there is no data, there is no accountability, there is no intersectionality. So in many ways, I would argue that a partnership like FB 2020 and the new partnership, the 2030 partnership, in some ways is posing itself to be a platform on which that discourse can happen. So I would ask you, um, having, having had to navigate this as a reference group member, but also as the, the head of MSI, how does a partnership stimulate that discourse and do so in a way that brings along many, or, you know, we often talk about family planning and contraception as this big tent issue, while not going at the pace of the slowest. Um, how can we be authentic in that way um, to, to stimulate that um, while actually leaning into what we know needs to be done? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And um, I think uh, I mean, the, the, the way we've always looked, looked at this, we, uh, MSI, as you know, deal, deals with a, a topic which is heavily stigmatized and, it, and it's difficult and it's uh, a lot of people have very strong, strong feelings about it. And but 90 percent of what we do, of course, is provision of contraception It's critical for me. And I think we, this is a great start because we're having this, these conversations and these are, you know, they're uncomfortable topics and, and we, we're not all experts in every aspect of them. But to, to start this type of discourse, I think is critically important. The, the, the main area for me is, first of all, to, to find common ground and identify things on which everybody can agree. I mean, the, these, these are human rights issues. These are about inclusion. These are about um, doing the right thing. These are about, about, about providing public health solutions. And there are many, many ways in which we can agree, even with people whose values are diff differ from ours, get them to engage on the topic and find solutions to very difficult problems, and accepting that this is one of many, many of those fairly intractable problems. How do you how do you close a gap in access, for example? It's, it's extremely difficult to, to deliver. But what, what I think the one thing we can learn from the last four years is, is that tribalism and um, trying to take a view that if you're not with us, you're against us is, is completely wrong. And that even if we are going to tackle very difficult issues like access and uh, access to, with, for people with disabilities, for example, uh, or, or for those living in extreme poverty or for youth, uh, that we've got to find the common ground with the people who are going to support those programs, and those who might otherwise oppose those uh, activities, and f fundamentally agree that we need to put some of the solutions in the hands of those who um, for whom we're trying to serve. And that, I think, this d discussion has started that very well. Um, for, for us, it's about the client. We we call you know her the person we serve the client. It's about um, tending to her needs and putting her in control of the discussion, not the provider or the doctor, and it's certainly not a decision for the government or the, the church. Uh, this is about what women and girls want primarily, and uh, moving, moving in that direction, starting the way we've done today, but keeping focus on the, the fact that we must engage the, the broader community, the donor community, and we mustn't marginalize ourselves in this discussion, because if we make this a too, di put it in the too difficult category, bearing in mind all the other things that governments have to have to fund, then we might end up with, you know, having a very important topic which people are not putting the right types of funding and resources behind so it's a great start but let's also look at the bigger picture there's a, there's a big need for funding to get to to close these gaps um, i think fp 2020 outlined uh, outlined exactly what that gap looks like we've made good progress we're hardly halfway there and um, probably about a quarter of the way versus unmet need if and has gone back a bit uh, and we've got to, we've got to make sure that that is the the common goal behind which which we're all completely uh, united. Well said, Simon. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for this engaging discussion. Thank you for all of our guests for joining us today. Um, we hope you will continue to join us on this journey of progressive realization of rights that is intersectional, that is community led. Uh, that is discourse driven. Um, so thank you once again. Um, 
and uh, looking forward to your uh, continued partnership. Thanks again to everyone who has been engaging with us on social media during this panel. Thank you for sending in your questions. As Simon and the rest of our panelists indicated, we know this is just the start of a conversation and the beginning of FP 2030's journey towards a progressive realization of a vision of equity and justice. So our panelists raised many important issues and we will be following up with the community with specific opportunities for engagement on how FP 2030 can play a role in implementing some of their important recommendations and in um, furthering those discussions. Uh, we know that it takes all of us to operationalize rights and move towards equity with governments having a critical role. So let us turn now to reflections from governments on how they have engaged with FB 2020 as a launching pad for their own evolution on rights-based family planning. It is indeed an honor for me to be a part of this momentous event celebrating the crucial Family Planning 2020 partnership. We have witnessed an impressive decline in fertility and maternal mortality in the last few years. Moving towards the next phase of Family Planning partnership, we realize that advancing collaborations, adopting a more focused approach, and addressing the needs of young population will be of prime importance. Every child is wanted, every birth is safe, and every girl and woman is treated with dignity. Namaste, we have worked meticulously in all three areas of commitment, that is policy and political, financial, program and service delivery. The right to safe motherhood and reproductive health is taken as a fundamental right in the constitution of Nepal. Post-2020 commitment, we recover from the impact of COVID-19 and strengthening the health system to make more resilient and able to deliver in any crisis and putting extra effort to address the vulnerable and marginalized communities. Under FP 2020, we have improved uh, reproductive health and family planning. This is under the Chief Minister's stewardship. We have integrated both family planning and um, uh, health ministries. I'm Talib Lashari from Pakistan. In 2015, I developed the CIP. Some of the interventions like Family Health Days, capacity building, engaging youth and male, and media and parliamentarians. It has overall implication for more than 800,000 new additional users. Lors de, du dernier atelier de Dakar avec les FP 2020, nous avons constaté certaines insuffisances au niveau de la loi de la santé et de la reproduction, oubliant ou mettant en marge certaines personnes vulnérables pour la planification familiale, en particulier les adolescents, pour les adolescents mariés et les sujets jeunes. Et nous avons donc opté pour pouvoir faire du lobbying et au niveau du Parlement pour pouvoir intégrer ces personnes-là dans le cadre de la planification familiale. My expectation in the new partnership, I look forward to strengthening data visibility that we ensure the segregated uh, data being available for decision making, even at the subnational level. I also look forward to having strong technical assistance on innovative service delivery and family planning supply chain. And finally, I hope that we have sustained high level advocacy to support family planning 2030. Kicking off the next phase of our partnership, the Philippines will focus our efforts on adolescent reproductive health while sustaining the gains in family planning across all age groups. We endeavor to support 
and pushed approval of the teen pregnancy bill currently at the Senate. With universal healthcare implementation, we commit to provide resources large in the special health fund of provinces and cities to safeguard an interrupted supply of FP commodities. In the name of the Partner of the Secretary of MPS что повысило роль планирования семьи для достижения более широких результатов в области здравоохранения и благополучия. В следующем десятилетии Министерство здравоохранения рассматривает совершенствовать и преориентировать планирование семьи для повышения индивидуального благосостояния, обеспечения всеобщего медицинского обслуживания, достижения результатов в области человеческого капитала, а также для содействия достижению целей в области гендерной проблематики, охраны здоровья и прав женщин. Создание целенаправленных и равноправных партнерств с уязвимыми группами населения и голос сообщества будет служить основой для доработки введения 2030 года в ближайшие месяцы. For decades, the United States has been the largest bilateral donor to family planning globally. Many partners at USAID have been unwavering in their commitment to the partnership throughout the last eight years, including as focal points in countries around the world and in their role as a core convener and on the reference group. We're excited to continue this close relationship as we enter a new administration and move together toward 2030. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce Chris Milligan, Counselor at USAID. Hello, Chris. Thank you, Beth. Uh, hello, everyone. And depending on where you are, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening from a very wintry Washington, D.C. On behalf of the United States Agency for International Development, and as the agency's counselor, it is my pleasure, actually, it is my honor to join you for today's event as we celebrate noteworthy achievements by the FP 2020 Partnership and importantly, we recommit ourselves to an even brighter and better future. I want to begin by acknowledging the FP2020 Secretariat. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership, your, your hard work, and, and your commitment over these past eight years. I also want to thank the extended FP2020 community and country partners for your continued dedication to the health and well-being of women and girls everywhere. As you all well know, Access to family planning and reproductive health services is critical to the well being of women and children worldwide. And as the world's largest family planning bilateral donor, USAID has supported voluntary family planning and reproductive health efforts for over 50 years. And we remain committed to helping countries meet the family planning and reproductive health needs of their people. And we support family planning programs in the majority of FP 2020 focused countries. Meeting the needs of women and girls in these countries today and building effective platforms to address their needs in the future will accelerate progress toward the goals of both USAID and the FP 2030 partnership and ultimately enable more women and girls to thrive, to participate in the economic, social, and political progress of their countries. As a core FP2020 member, USAID's work with the partnership has enabled us to further enhance and advance our family planning programming in support of our own agency goals of preventing maternal and child deaths, as well as our broader development goals. We are so pleased to have worked together with FP2020 commitment makers to accelerate progress for women and girls worldwide and we look forward to even more engagement in the next phase of this important partnership. Over the course of this partnership, we have all made enormous strides, not only in reaching millions of women and girls with modern contraception, but in providing a global forum for new conversations and engagements around voluntary family planning, and in creating a robust international community of practice that will carry this work forward. The FP 2020 partnership well, it has been a platform, a platform conv for convening a diverse 
inclusive, and results-oriented community, encompassing a wide range of stakeholders and experts with varying perspectives. At USAID, in support of the partnership, we have focused our efforts on furthering the global conversation around family planning and strengthening programming for greater availability of and access to the broad range of family planning options. Our work has resulted in expanding product availability to ensure that more women have access to a wider range of contraceptive methods and the ability to choose an option that best suits their needs and lifestyle. Working through our field staff and together with FP2020, we have strengthened country ownership, including engaging with government and civil society partners to prioritize investment in family planning programs and build sustainability. We've emphasized social and behavior change strategies to support the goals of the partnership with a particular focus on enabling healthy decision-making among young people, greater male engagement for adopting positive gender norms and addressing provider behavior to improve the quality of family planning services. More recently, we have prioritized the recognition of family planning services and contraceptive supplies as essential life-saving health interventions that need to be maintained during the COVID-19 crisis. Now, now more than ever, it is crucial to ensure that the reproductive health needs of women and girls and their continued access to voluntary family planning remain at the forefront of current and future responses to global health emergencies. As we step into the next decade of this partnership, the future direction of FP2030 is strong and it augments USAID's continued commitment to volunteerism, informed choice, rights, and equity. President Biden has singled his intent to revoke the Protecting Life and Global Health Policy as part of his administration's broader commitment to protect women's health and advance gender equality at home and around the world. Access to contraceptives, prevention of gender-based violence, and programming that is responsive to women's health remains preeminent in U.S. global health and development assistance. USAID looks forward to working with FP2030 and other international partners to support these empowering and transformative interventions. Collaboration with local partners around the world to confront health and development challenges remains at the core of what we do. We are pleased that the next chapter of the partnership focuses on greater country involvement, and it seeks to transfer leadership to regional FP2030 hubs and allow for the diversity of perspectives and more local country-based alliances and decision-making. Congratulations once again to the Secretariat for your leadership and achievements over the past eight years, and to everyone who's been supportive and participating in this important work. At USAID, we look forward to the next phase of our journey together and to a future where all women and girls are empowered to thrive and, and live healthy and productive lives. Together with all of you, I know we look forward to the release of the first annual report from FP2030. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we really appreciate your remarks and your enthusiasm. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge the incredible work of your team, Ellen Starbird, Carrie Pelsner, Alex Todd, throughout um, the FP2020 partnership. USAID leadership has meant so much. I also want to help our audience understand one thing that you mentioned. You talked about uh, President Biden soon. He's committed to uh, repealing the prevent for preserving life and global health assistance. Many people in our audience know that as the global gag rule. So I just wanted to make sure that they were aware that that will be repealed soon. And we also wanna commend you for rejoining the World Health Organization. These are such positive and important steps to all of us. So thank you, Chris, for being here today to share that with us and to talk about USAID's ongoing commitment. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Cheers. Great. Well, with that, we're now entering the sort of final turn of our event today, and we have one last panel discussion. And in this discussion, we wanted to bring together many partners that are very familiar to all of you and also some new partners to help us look ahead at the shape of the partnership and um, where we'll be going together. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you many people you know well, including Marie Ba, the director of the Wagadougou Partnership Coordination Unit. 
Helga Fogstad, the Executive Director of the Partnership for, for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health, and an FB 2020 Reference Group member. Joshua Taba, Director General for Global Health at Global Affairs Canada, also an FP2020 Reference Group member. Dr. Sonia Cafe, Regional Adolescent Health Advisor for the Pan American Health Organization. And finally, Dr. Natasha Kaoma, <clears throat> Chief Executive Officer of Copper Rose Zambia, and also an FP2020 Reference Group member. So thank you all for joining us here today. And again, the purpose of this panel is really to share together both what FB 2020 has meant, but more importantly, to look to the future, to the next iteration of the partnership, and to envision how we'll be able to make progress, or we believe we will make progress on the issues that are critical to the work that you're all doing. So let's start with Marie. Um, many of you are aware that the Wagadugu Partnership was launched in 2011. We talk about the sisterhood between the Wagadugu Partnership and FP 2020, and now FP 2030, and how the Wagadugu Partnership has really paved the way. Um, in West Africa and helped to shape some of the thinking around FB 2020 when we were originally launched. So we'd love to hear your perspectives, Marie, on how our partnership has worked together um, to advance the objectives in the region in which you focus. Thank you so much. And um, thank you, Beth. And hi, everyone. First off, um, our more uh, sincere thanks for giving the OPC a chance to share with this broad audience about our experience in collaboration. And most of all, congratulations on officially launching uh, FP 2030. Um, to answer your first question, I think most already know that throughout the years, the OP countries um, have been privileged enough to take advantage of both our initiatives, making it a unique region in that position. So there is pride and excitement from our focal points that we've heard of, of being part of a global movement and being able to exchange with other Francophone countries within the movement, but also um, a wider range of uh, countries and different contexts, for example. So they've been able to take advantage of two secretariats, not just one, uh, working together on coordination, on exchanges and learning, on increasing exposure and visibility, especially for our civil society who've been asking for it uh, for a long time. So the collaboration between the two partnerships have helped um, multiply our resources. We both have funds that are available um, to our focal points in our countries. It's helped expand both of our networks and it's also helped deepen uh, the relationships in countries. And for us, the OPCU, for example, open up new doors and help us work with some of the global partners out there. Great, thank you, Marie. So the OP is focused on nine Francophone countries. PMNCH is focused on all of us, every place around the world, um, with a focus, with a real look at maternal health as well, but increasingly working on sexual and reproductive health and rights as well. Helga, I'd like to turn to you next and to talk, you know, we, um, through the partnership with PMNCH, we expanded our own portfolio on postpartum and post-abortion family planning. We built stronger relationships with midwives and OBGYN organizations and included maternal health advocates and experts on the reference group such as yourself. So I'd just love to hear your perspectives on how the partnerships have worked together and what opportunities you see um, going forward. Thank you for that, Beth, and uh, congratulations on FB 2020's transformation to FB 2030. Uh, as executive director of PMNCA, representing over a thousand partner organizations and multiple constituencies, I would like to acknowledge PMNCA's long and continuing commitment to supporting family planning and SRHR. Um, we have enjoyed very much the collaboration that we've had with FB 2020. Uh, which has made tremendous progress since its inception in 2012 at the London Summit on, on Family Planning, not only uh, you know, generating country commitments and billions of dollars in funding, but also forging links with the maternal health community and healthcare providers, notably uh, midwives, uh, to help integrate family uh, planning with the continuum of care. Uh, for women, uh, adolescents, and, and newborns. So integrating services has been proven to be cost-effective and smart, and this is something that you've really um, looked at uh, seriously. So including also advocates uh, has helped amplify family planning, you know, FP 2020 investment case. Uh, this has facilitated diverse partners to make the case for family planning, 
as a best buy, which is also critical for our collective advocacy uh, effort. So one of FP 2020's strength is the use of data to measure aspects of the environment for family planning, uh, the process of delivering services, <clears throat> the impact of contraceptive use, and the rate of return uh, for every country to globally and national level advocacy effort is of vital importance. Uh, so in July 2020, uh, PIM and CH and its partners issued a seven point call to uh, action in response to the devastating effects of COVID-19 on the health and well-being of women, children and adolescents. It calls on leaders to protect and uh, prioritize their rights and health during COVID-19 response and recovery or for uh, strengthening political commitment and political policies and financing for vital health uh, services, including for family, family planning information services and supplies, uh, particularly for the most vulnerable. This call for action builds on uh, our new uh, five-year uh, strategy. Uh, which similarly prioritizes comprehensive and high quality sexual and reproductive health services. FP 2030 has a key role in mobilizing for these commitments, which FP 2020 has definitely paved the uh, way for. Thank you. Thank you, Helga. You have our commitment that we will be um, a sort of a full court press, if you will, on commitments throughout 2021. It's a year of transformation for us. It's a year for everybody to explore together what the true impact of COVID has been and to recalibrate ambitions based on the reality of services and financing in each country. But also we want to lean in with you and with the Wagadugu Partnership on advocacy at every level. We'll continue at high level advocacy, but I do think this new approach that we all believe we need to take to better funding for advocates in countries, to ensuring that young people are equal participants in all places where SRHR and family planning are being discussed. There's opportunity for so much common cause here as we all look toward improving you know, the opportunities for well-being for women and girls. Because as I believe it was Mitchell Warren said earlier, it's one body. We don't need different advocates sort of fighting for different uh, priorities and different channels. We need to come together for women and girls, and I believe that we can. So next, I'm pleased to turn to Joshua to share with us a little bit more about Canada's um, feminist foreign policy and your investment in sexual and reproductive health and rights and in family planning. I know that that perspective has really been inspiring and helped others to imagine how governments can rethink their approach to women, to development, and to overall well-being. So Joshua, over to you. Thanks, Beth, and congratulations on this big step. It's been quite a journey. Canada announced its support for FP 2020 when we made our first significant commitment to comprehensive SRHR in March 2017. And right away, we then co-organized the high-level family planning summit that summer to spur global action to help meet FP 2020's goals and to advance the 2030 agenda. And this involvement has driven our focus on contraceptives and family planning as a priority component of ensuring access to comprehensive SRHR. Since 2017, we've increased dedicated funding while also leveraging our engagement in global health platforms to champion the importance of family planning, access to modern contraceptives, and SRHR more generally. We've deepened our engagement with the Wagadugu Partnership and the She Decides Movement, and we've increased collaboration with many of the partners we've discussed today, at UNFPA Supplies, MSI, IPBF, many, many others, uh, including to mitigate the impacts of the pandemic over the last 10 months. So for us, like Helga, the partnership's commitment to data has really been critical. It helps inform our increased investments in this space. And compelling data, like those we've discussed today, really help us better tell the story of why family planning is so important, why all countries must be involved. And Canada does frame its international assistance now through a feminist lens. So we view access to services and the realization of rights, including for family planning specifically, as critical for advancing gender equality and the empowerment of women and adolescent girls and dependent on those as well. As women and girls continue to be subject to multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination, we're committed to addressing how to dismantle these barriers to ensure access and to explore how everyone has a role to play in the creation of standards at both the global and national levels. 
those national standards protect, respect, and fulfill the sexual and reproductive rights of all women and girls. So through our engagement with F the FP movement, we'll continue to encourage feminist analysis that addresses intersectional power dynamics, working together to build connections between like-minded partners and those unable to take a vocal stance. Together, we can increase the folk, these voices at these tables and in these conversations with the goal of ensuring that all women and girls can decide for themselves whether, when, and with whom to have children, taking control of their bodies, their lives, and their futures. Our longstanding relationship with the FP partnership has been and will continue to be a core part of this. I applaud the partnership's decentralization, putting more resources and control into regions, anchoring the partnership in the countries it serves will help to better identify needs, strengthen accountability, deliver results in overcoming barriers and increasing access and autonomy. It's an exciting time for the partnership. We're thrilled to be playing a role in it. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, Joshua. We're thrilled to have you be a part of the partnership as well. And we look forward to exploring together how we can expand that partnership for FP 2030. I think the points you made around um, the feminist foreign policy are particularly important and, and show how you know, there can be normative changes at all levels of global development and having Canada help to lead the way, as I said before, and reimagining that is really important. We're reimagining as well um, the shape of the overall partnership, as we said earlier, will move under FP 2030 from having 69 focused countries to welcoming any country who wishes to make a commitment. We'll have a tailored and sort of a bespoke approach, if you will, to each of those countries based on their own development path. But one of the areas that we're particularly um, pleased to be moving into is a deeper relationship with the Latin America and the Caribbean region. Under FP 2020, 69 focused countries, four countries in that region were included, but only one made a commitment and that was Haiti. Um, yet we realize there's so much work to do and so many opportunities for advocacy at every level with Latin American partners. And so Sonia, welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'd love to hear your perspectives on the opportunities ahead for partnership with the Latin American Caribbean region. You may be on mute. So there sorry. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be part of this panel. And of course, I'm joining my congratulations to FP 2020, making the transition to FP 2030. Um, and we welcome you very much to the region. Um, it is, uh, of course, um, FP 2020 is not an unknown in our region. We have always appreciated um, and we know, I know that many uh, partners and uh, professionals in our region have benefited from your capacity building activities, your documents, um, and as PAHO, of course, uh, we are the regional organization, the regional organization for the World Health Organization. And so since WHO is a commitment organization, we are also committed to the, tar the same targets as you. We share a lot of priorities in our region, in Latin America and the Caribbean. We have unfinished agendas when it comes to maternal health, uh, adolescent pregnancy, um, access to um, sexual and reproductive health services. Uh, and so it is for us a continuing priority. And we that's why I'm saying we, we do welcome you to our region because uh, together, I am sure we can achieve much more. We have a lot of partners that we already work with. Well, as PAHO, we work very closely with our sister organization, with UNFPA, uh, with UNICEF. Um, very important uh, actors in Latin America and the Caribbean are the sub-regional integration mechanisms and, of course, our member states. Uh, we are also, we can also say that we have seen some progress for instance, in the reduction of adolescent pregnancy, some countries have made progress in uh, recent years. We also have made progress when it comes to reduction of uh, maternal mortality. However, um, our progress is fragile, uh, very dependent on continued political support um, and availability of the resources necessary to continue the work. Um, and so 
your con your, your uh, uh, contribution when it comes to capacity building, when it comes to advocacy, are very welcome and very uh, timely in our region, especially when we consider that um, COVID-19 is a threat to our progress. Um, we are still yet to fully understand the impact that COVID-19 will have. And so all hands on board, um, uh, on deck, as we say. And we so we welcome you and we look forward to collaborate with you, to partner with you um, for the good of all the women, children, and adolescents in our region. Thank you, Sonia. All hands indeed. And, you know, as we're thinking about COVID-19, the Latin America region also had to work through the Zika crisis as well. So you have many experiences the rest of the world can also learn from, including longstanding family planning programs and the advocacy that's still outstanding. There's so much more work to do on adolescent pregnancy, as you mentioned, and in reaching indigenous populations. I do think that common cause and the sharing of advocacy approaches, um, data, accountability, all of that can help to strengthen the partnerships that are there and also allow all of us to learn from the successes of your region as well. So thank you very much for joining the panel and encouraging this kind of expansion over time. I want to turn now to Natasha. Natasha, you've been on the reference group for a little over a year now, maybe close to two years, and you come at a bit of a disadvantage in this event today um, because we've heard from a number <laughs> of other young people about engagement with young people. It's, it's very clear we've started, but we're not there. I'd love to hear your perspectives on what your engagement has meant, but also what it's meant in Zambia and the kinds of leadership there that are really transforming the dynamics within your country when it comes to SRHR. So over to you. Thank you so much, Beth. I'd like to thank FP 2020, 2030 now for this opportunity and congratulations to you. When I think about meaningful youth engagement, I'd like to think about my experience within the reference group. First of all, FP 2020 has involved young people into many different aspects of the work. First of all, it was through the focal point systems. The focal point systems allowing young people to join did come close to the end of the partnership, but they were beneficial and they have been beneficial because they say better late than never. But I would like to give examples of tangible ways in which these systems do help integrate young people into decision making. In Zambia, for example, in 2020, we were developing the country implementation plan. And because of the focal point systems, young people like me and many other groups were involved in this process and have been able to give our voice, but also to lead some of the sessions. I was leading the adolescent and youth uh, component and leading focus group discussions. And those are opportunities for leadership, which would not have been possible without this focal point mechanism. I'd also like to say that meaningful youth engagement to me also means factoring in the time that young people are spending on the work. And FP 2020 has uh, or did factor in um, time that young people were spending through things like honorariums, through youth engagement grants. But I would like to see a lot more of such things going further into FP 2030. The importance of factoring in the time that young people are spending gives value to, to what they're contributing. Because for a lot of young people, this is not their full-time job. They also need to earn an income. Whereas for most other people that are playing a role in these spaces who have a car drive them from one meeting to the other, but young people will still need support to get to the same meeting that is being supported. When I think about FP 2030, I'd like to say that it would be great to see that the meaningful youth engagement is strengthened and some of the ways I'm thinking about it is engaging young people at all levels. There are structures that have been proposed and I would like to see more young people at every single step or at every step that's possible, especially all the way through to the governing body and not just leaving young people to the champions group or to other um, smaller groupings, which I think have less of a voice or have less power in decision making. I'd also like to see young people being hired to work at some of these hubs. Because we often think of young people as beneficiaries, we think of young people as only advocates, but we do have young professionals who would play a huge role in ensuring that there's more meaningful engagement because you may need these people in-house to be able to guide and to be able to direct some of the best practices for engagement. So those are some of the ways that I would like to see a meaningful youth engagement. 
Thank you, Natasha. I think you yourself are an incredible represent, representative of the potential there. You're a medical doctor. You're a CEO of your own NGO. You participate in global processes, and you're helping to drive local change within your own country. I don't think we need a more compelling advertisement than for what we're missing out if we're not actually working with young people. So thank you for continuing to make that, make that push on all of us. And I just want to reassure you that we absolutely have the intention of having at least two among um, this, the seats on the governing board reserved for young people and will continue to ensure that young people are part of the focal point processes that really just reflect the technical working groups and countries, but making sure that we're not disadvantaging um, in that work going forward. And I hear your call loud and clear that these are professional relationships and they need, to, they need to be treated as such, not as a voluntary, not as some sort of a gift that we're giving to young people to let them in, but rather we need to step back and learn from young people and make sure that they're leading the processes in control of decision-making themselves because it's not about me. I'm in my 50s. I have what I need. But there are many, many young people around the world, the world's largest population of young people, and we have to be focusing on that. I believe that's been loud, that's been heard loud and clear. Now it's about really making sure that we make those changes. So you have my commitment that we'll be doing that to the extent um, that we can while I'm still with FP2020, but I know FP2030 is committed to that as well. So Maria, I'd like to go back to you just to make sure that um, we talk a little bit about these hubs, as Natasha mentioned. We will be having a hub in West and Central Africa, and I am excited that we will be hiring from people or among people from those regions. So they will be staffed by people from, in this case, Western Central Africa. And we'll be looking for an opportunity to be working closely with the OPCU as well. So I'm wondering how you imagine that relationship might look when we have more of a physical presence and what opportunities you see on the horizon for that. Right, um, and I think given that, that new structure for FP2030 is an opportunity for both our initiatives and the fact that the OP has increased aspirations in the region. As you know, we have a new and ambitious goal of reaching uh, 13 million um, women and, and girls uh, as new um, users of modern contraceptive methods. So we within the OPC and the OP obviously are uh, committed to working more closely and in synergy with a regionally based hub and making ourselves both the Secretariat and the countries available for the new FP2030 Western Central Africa uh, regional hub. So supporting its transfer, but also strengthening and anchoring the local and regional connections that we already have in the region. Um, I think it's also a way of avoiding, for example, duplicating efforts and making sure that we are using our comparative advantages and, and strength to improve the lives and health of young women and girls. I also think, um, given the specificities of some of the OP countries, we can pay, pay special attention uh, to data uh, as regards to OP countries uh, and how that data can inform advocacy and policymakers. Data is obviously a strong suit for the FP2020, and that is something that the OP and OPC are looking forward to working more closely. And I've heard, for example, um, our last colleague talking about um, the significant involvement of youth. We've been trying to do that more and more within the OP and the OPCU. And I think this new um, focal point structure where we included um, youth and we worked closely together, the OPCU and the FP2020 Secretariat, to actually choose those focal points was one example where I think collaboration went great. And just working, um, more closely and 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 seeing how we can improve the significant involvement of youth in our both our initiatives, but also within the movement and giving them more voices. And like I said, not just as um, interns or as focal points, but also having a more prominent role in the initiatives, the structures, and also implementing um, some of the programs that the partners have in place. Great, thank you, Marie. I 
one of the things I really enjoyed about our partnership as well was when we had a Francophone focal point workshop, we brought together the nine OP countries, but also the many other Francophone countries from Madagascar to Haiti. And it really was a great opportunity to work and learn together. We won't be working by linguistic breakup anymore, but we hope that we'll be able to bring together, you know, Anglophone partners in the region as well with OP. And I just want to make a quick comment as well and and give an apology to many of our listeners today. We were able to provide um, French translation, but not uh, Lusophone or... Russian or Spanish. And so we hope that we'll have the funding to be more inclusive going forward in the next iteration of the partnership. But just wanted to acknowledge the many partners around the world who are listening and the opportunities to work together. So we have about five minutes left on this panel. So Helga, quickly, I wanted to um, get your perspectives on your expansion to SRHR and particularly to person-centered care, um, because we know that that's a, been a big turning point for PMNCH in, the, in recent years as well. Can you um, share a bit about that perspective as well going forward? Yeah, thank you for that. So the broader SRHR um, uh, movement requires the integration of sexual reproductive health services within the primary health care system, including family planning services, FDI screening, pregnancy care, prevention and management of gender-based violence. Integration should also include information, um, commodity and support for self-care, including self-administrative methods of uh, um, contraception, as well as comprehensive sexuality uh, education. So it's uh, something about uh, bringing the sectors and, and also services and, and, and the continuum in, in the age groups logically uh, together so that it makes uh, sense uh, to the woman and to the child and, and, and to the adolescent uh, in some way uh, so that uh, it becomes a really person, you know, um, people centric uh, in that it's uh, not only cost effective, but it's cost effective because it's very convenient. Um, and, and people then understand uh, what the value is to their own health and, and, and so forth. So I think in some ways um, that is really important to focus on, on the benefits of bringing uh, sectors, uh, constituencies, um, stakeholders, uh, and, and also, and also uh, sectors together in order to uh, create a win-win situation. I agree, and I look forward to our new hubs being able to do that in a country, in a regional way, in a way that um, the Ouagadougou Partnership has been able to explore and be able to do that in countries around the world. So we only have a little over a minute left, so with apologies to Joshua and Sonia for not going back to you, but I want to give Natasha the last word and um, invite you to just share your perspectives on all of this, on the FP2030 partnership as well, and where you really want to see us going forward. Thanks so much, Beth. I'd like to say that one thing that has been really uh, on my mind is that I think that the family planning movement needs to think about programming as well. There's a lot of money that is being um, targeted towards advocacy, coordination, and data. But from my perspective, from my part of the world, that's not enough. Because advocacy is more potent when coupled with service provision, when coupled with services. And some of our governments feel like advocacy is merely finger pointing. And that's what we are known for as advocates. I'd like to see a situation in which we are also mobilizing resources for actual service provision or for actual support or supplementation of the government efforts as far as service provision is concerned. I think that's one of the ways we will get some of the figures or some of the data like the unmet need that has been at 20 something for the last 10 or 15 years. That's the missing piece, I would say. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Natasha. It's always loved working with you and learning from you. It's been a terrific partnership. And I want to thank everybody, Marie, Helga, Sonia, Joshua, Natasha. Thank you for help helping us to sort of push into 2030 and to launch this new partnership. There will be so many opportunities across 2021 to build this together. And I look forward to working with all of you. So thank you for your time today and your partnership um, in the past and going forward. So now we're near the end of uh, today's event, and we've had so many people 
uh, commenting and engaging in active conversation online. It's been really exciting and inspiring. And so I want to thank everybody who's used the hashtag MyFPStory uh, for joining in that process. I want to thank all of our speakers today as well for your thoughtful remarks. Um, and as a community, we've been through so much together, especially over this past year of the COVID pandemic. You know, it's in times of crisis like this, you realize how much a partnership and relationships of trust matter and mean in order to find your way forward. We have so much to build on as a community um, that will take this partnership forward to 2030. And as you've seen, there are so many relevant opportunities uh, regarding sexual reproductive health and broader health care and well-being rights, equity, justice, and development priorities overall. By transitioning to the regional hub model, as we've discussed, we will be able to explore those relationships on a much more relevant level beyond global to countries and regions. And we're thankful to everyone for doing this together and deciding what we can be together. As a secretariat, we've been honored to play a role in this. Um, but this is a partnership that's truly owned by the people, by all of you, and in the next phase, we hope that we will take that more deeply and make it ever more engaging. As we heard from Dr. Kenham, we know where we're going, and we know how to get there. The march forward continues. I hope you'll join us. And we also hope that you'll join us tomorrow as we dive deeper on the 2019-2020 Progress Report, FP2020, The Arc of Progress. We'll be doing a really deep dive on the data and the narrative over the past year as well. So if you're interested in more information, please do join us then. You can find the link to join that on our website. Um, and we're excited to see all of you next week at the Virtual International Family Planning Conference, February 2nd and 3rd, where we can continue to discuss how we accelerate progress over the coming decade together. Thank you again for your time today and for your partnership over the last eight years. It's been an honor doing this important work with all of you. And I'm very hopeful and energized as we move into this year of transition to build FP2030. We hope you stay well be safe, and we look forward to seeing you all again in person, I hope, very soon. Thank you, and goodbye.